up your sinister folks, welcome to the part 14, of what if Deku's cursed blood could you know reverse death, chapter 41, sinister restoration disclaimer, Tay and present Mick sharing their family name, in this story, is just a coincidence. Don't think too hard about it. For now. A sinister restoration. Dr. Mdugshi, the man better known as the Heaven Cancellor, was an individual who had traveled the world in an effort to expand his knowledge and skills in the art of medicine in order to better, safeguard the health of his patients. And he'd been largely successful over his lifetime. Currently, the aging medic could honestly say there probably wasn't any other healthcare professional with his capabilities out there. It was the reason why no hospital he ever found himself in would ever fire him, even if he caused more than a few headaches with his methods. Are you absolutely sure about, this? Dr. Gshi asked, frowning in deep concern at the paralyzed form of Tensaida. Regardless of the waiver you've signed, you know you can still back out of this at any time. Even as the words left his mouth, the Heaven Cancellor knew they were wastes of air. The infamous monster of UA was coming, and nothing would dissuade the young man lying on the hospital bed before him from meeting, with the boy. Regardless of his dubious thoughts on the obscure quirk in question, they were going to see it in action soon enough. I'm... I'm sure, Tensai replied, weak in body though his steely determination still reflected strongly through his tired eyes. Even if my life as a hero is over, I cannot bear to remain a burden upon my family. Nodding along with the foolishness of youth, the Heaven, Cancellor solemnly accepted that his patient had made his choice. It was done. Throughout his travels, Dr. Gchi had witnessed all sorts of medical marvels and mysteries. He'd been granted access to the closely guarded cutting-edge technologies of the Germans. He'd participated in the magic rituals and spiritualism of Africa. He'd learned at the hands of Mexican herbalists and Chinese masters, and along the way he'd picked up kernels of understanding from everyone in between. But. This was the first time he'd ever see a mutant quirk that acted in every way like an emitter. Knock, knock. The soft trapping on the door signaled the awaited family members of his patient. Soon, the hospital room filled with people with vested interest in what was about to happen. First, of course, came the young man's mother. The teary woman was followed almost immediately after by a young lady the Heaven Cancellor could only guess, by her differing looks yet equally teary eyes, was his patient's significant other of some capacity. Paying only half a near to the ensuing conversation between the two women and the awkwardness of what was clearly a first meeting in less than ideal circumstances, the elderly doctor's mind turned to pondering the events about to unfold. While the old man despised the quirk hierarchy, the cataloging of such a widespread and seemingly chaotic force as quirks had been necessitated by humanity's nature and desire for understandable patterns. The artificial structure made quirkology even possible at all, and provided a known foundation for guidance. However, quirks, seemed to intrinsically rebel against such order and restraint, and while the first recorded instance of mutant-slash-emitter qualities, is Yuku Midoriya's ability wouldn't be the first reported case of the lines between general types being blurred. The young lady with thorny vines for hair that had participated in the latest UA sports festival, at the first year level, would be a fine example. Officially, the girl had been recorded as an emitter, but the story was in no way so simple. A look at her medical files had given Dr. Gshi the impression that Miss Ibar's quirk factor was largely concentrated in her hair follicles, to the point that the vines couldn't be removed to allow regular hair to grow. In fact, it would be easier to say the vines were her hair, and that her abilities, to grow and morph the vegetative appendages was more in line with her quirk being mutant at its roots, no pun intended, than an emitter with transformer tendencies. However, the old doctor hadn't lived as long as he had without being able to see when records said certain things because certain people wanted it that way, and he'd pulled his nose out of Miss Ibarra's business before someone had come, looking to cut it off. Now looking at Midoriya's file though, and the progression of the boy's quirk factor over time, it was far too easy to imagine how that first doctor that had checked him over had at first dismissed his quirk's potential, quirkist bigotry aside. 
even he would have been hard pressed to have seen anything special about cursed blood when it had first manifested, so, microscopic, again, no pun intended, were its readings. But now, officially, cursed blood still kept its original mutant designation. It was a simple quirk that manifested as single-celled microorganisms that actively sought out and repaired any and all damages accrued by their hosts, for example Midoriya's body regardless of whether that meant a trauma as simple as a cold infection or as drastic as a missing limb. It was a variant of the long-documented regenerator type by all accounts. That official file wasn't worth the paper it had been printed on. Sure. It could feasibly justify the boy's regeneration prowess, but it failed miserably to explain everything else Midoriya had been rumored to be capable of. Reanimating the dead? That was so far above and beyond regeneration it was a joke. The ability to then direct these reanimated bodies with commands they are required to follow? What about the fact that the undead were reported to be able to fully interact with the living with facsimiles of free will? Dr. Gchi knew a number of voodoo masters that would kill, literally, for even a slight clue as to how Midoriya's quirk had achieved such a feat. Personally, the Heaven Cancellor, would have loved to be able to strangle the idiot that had so egregiously misdiagnosed Midoriya when he'd been four. So much was now in such a precarious position after the boy had spent so many years under society's uncaring heel. Unfortunately, said doctor who'd gained his ire could no longer be contacted for some reason in any fashion. It was as if he'd been plucked out of the air one day. Poof, knock knock. A second coming of soft trapping interrupted the famous doctor's wandering thoughts. This time, four individuals entered the room, the youngest Ida boy, the young Midoriya, and two adult women of differing ages the doctor didn't know the identities of. Brother. I finally brought him. You'll be just fine now. Tenya Ida barely managed to restrain his voice to under shouting levels as, he chopped the air vigorously. Behind the excited teen, his verdant classmate let out a heavy sigh. Uh. Suddenly, the youngest Ida's mood shifted to one of confusion as he finally noticed there was someone else in his brother's room besides his doctor and their mother. He'd never seen this young woman with silvery hair ending in red tips before in his life. Why was she holding his brother's hand so gently? Excuse me miss, but who exactly are you? Hush Tenya. Tanakuita cut in immediately, reprimanding him without a second glance. She gave a conspiratory smile. This is Shiroki-chan. She's Tensai's fiancé. Your brother was going to introduce her to the family before. Before the attack. For a moment, the Ida matriarch's smile dropped. Just remembering the atrocity visited upon her, firstborn was enough to visibly stress her. Then, the weary mother pulled herself together. She and her family were putting a lot of faith in her youngest classmate's quirk. I'm Vice. Vice Shiroki, the young woman introduced herself, bowing shyly. I'm sorry for this sudden surprise. You should drop that name already, Tanako chided kindly choosing to ignore the look of betrayal that was most likely from the fact his older brother hadn't told him of something as important as the fact he'd been seeing a woman. She could relate, but it wasn't important at the moment. As soon as Tensai is up and moving again, we're going straight to the manor to update the family registry. Once you two are married, if he needs any more time to recover, you'll be staying with us. Meanwhile, as this conversation was happening, is Yuku sighed again. It appeared that no matter what he involved himself in, others managed to add more pressure to the situation even when he made it clear he offered no guarantees. Just because cursed blood had only failed once so far didn't mean something couldn't go wrong this time. And why was Ida's older brother's fiancé trying to be sneaky about giving him the side eye treatment? The Verdanet was pretty sure he'd never met the young woman before in his life. Mrs. Asui, it's been a while, Dr. Gchi said, greeting the frog woman who'd been both a long-time ally against the greed of corporations seeking to wrest his knowledge from him for their own profits, as well as a tangential foe whenever her clients were patients suing a hospital he happened to be working in at the time. May I assume your presence here is an indication that you will be protecting the interests of young Midoriya? Nodding lightly, 
Baru Asui took in the presence of the Heaven Chancellor, a man she held conflicting emotions about. On one hand, she did respect the man. He stood for his vision and ideals and had never wavered from them. On the other, she absolutely hated his methodology. He might have always meant well, truly, but there had never been an instance where if conventional methods failed, or proved insufficient to his expectations, the old coot wouldn't immediately unleash a legal nightmare of biblical proportions with his natural and unnatural methods. If he wasn't dedicated to keeping his patients alive, Baru was sure Dr. Chi would have been labeled, a supervillain decades ago, always a pleasure doctor, the frog woman said, keeping her tone professional, I'll be making sure my soon-to-be son-in-law won't be blindsided by any questionable practices during the procedure, yes. As well as limiting any unrealistic expectations. That last was thrown out with an unsubtle glare at the Eta group. In an ideal world, the procedure would work exactly as intended without complications or repercussions. In an ideal world, even if today ended in failure, and Tensaida somehow remained paralyzed, there would have been no negative blowback on the individual offering his assistance voluntarily. Unfortunately, the world was not ideal. As much as Baru trusted Izuku with her eldest daughter's life, and as much as she wanted to believe the Ada were a righteous and honorable family, the frog woman knew that cursed blood was notorious for throwing a wild card into any situation. The quirk could be counted on to aid some, and that support likely extended to her entire family. But strangers? At best, she had to be prepared for the unexpected, as impossible as that truly was. Perfectly reasonable, Dr. Xi replied, his good spirits standing very out of place in the somber atmosphere of the hospital room. Does that mean that this younger miss beside you then is young Midoriya's mother? Inko, blushing at the innocuous reference to her rejuvenated appearance, was absolutely out of her element. Her new friend Baru had been incredibly welcoming since the incident that had brought their two families together. However, thanks to the woman's help, she quickly began to see the world her son was positioning himself to move in, and frankly, she'd felt self-conscious of her social standing. As a middle-class widow and single mother, should she really be mingling with such ridiculously influential people? And now she could add world-renowned doctor to that list as well? Ah. Um. Yes, that's right, Inko replied, barely managing to string two words, together. It was only her dire need to safeguard her son's life that gave her the strength to push past her own crushing anxiety. Now smiling, the infamous doctor moved to shake hands, but Baru gave the elderly man a look. The frog woman hadn't needed a clairvoyance quirk to know that the heaven cancellor no doubt wanted to poke and prod at Enko for answers. Answers that, to be fair, they had. Just weren't prepared to share. Dr. Ugchi, Baru said gravely. I shouldn't have to say this, but what will happen here today is not to be revealed to the public, understood? Of course not, the Heaven Cancellor replied, waving off the concern. He knew very well how practices that were seen as less than the arbitrary good that society set for itself could negatively affect the life of a good, Samaritan who just wanted to help. The breadth and scope of young Midoriya's quirk is not for me to publicize. You know I know how devastating such infamy can be to one's personal life. At that reassurance, Baru couldn't help the involuntary sigh of relief. With Dr. Shuzenji and Go being kept on tight leash thanks to Nezu and his policies, and now even the Heaven Cancellor promising to keep quiet, they might actually have a chance at keeping the extent of Izuku's capabilities under wraps. Of course, there were the rumors spread by students which had started to make their way to the masses, but those were all unsubstantiated and could be waved away as childishness. As long as professionals, those who would be listened to by the public at large, could be kept in line. Baru shivered as, she imagined what would happen if Cursed Blood's currently known limits were fully released. Just imagining the line of people who'd swarm the poor boy demanding all sorts of healing services caused her stomach to clench and that concern didn't even touch on the fear of all of the monsters that would reach out from the shadows to take advantage of such power for their own gain. That being said, 
Dr. Xi said suddenly, interrupting the frog woman's thoughts, I will still insist upon being present to monitor the procedure. Ten Saida is still my patient after all, and as such, I am still responsible for his well-being. Izuku struggled not to groan. This five-minute visit to his classmate's brother was becoming a trip to hell for the Verdanet. He could understand all of the assurances and such though, he really didn't want to give those hypocritical vultures that had been demonizing him and his quirk any more fuel to throw on the dumpster fire that was his public image than he had to. He wondered though, just how bad it would be for him to go from the monster of UA to the panacea of the world if his healing capabilities were made public without context. Yeah, no, he'd gladly heal the sick, the injured, and the suffering. Make no mistake, he wasn't unwilling to help. But there were limits to what he could do, limits to what people would be willing to accept when it came to curse blood, both when the quirk worked and when it didn't. Excuse me. Tanya interrupted, visibly holding his impatience back. Can we please get started now? The adults in the room, turned to glance at the vibrating youth. He refused to flinch at the sudden attention. I suppose so, the Heaven Cancellor said, shrugging. He turned back to Baru and Inko. That is, if young Midoriya is ready. Does the man of the hour have everything he needs? Before that, Baru said, interrupting again with a raised hand, the agreement? Actually, Izuku said, raising his voice. The Verdanet had, had enough. Ten Saida is the only one from who I need permission from. He's the only one I need to tell me he's ready for this. There was a moment of silence. Assurances aside, Izuku was adamant on hearing the words for himself. He wanted Ten Saida to declare his acceptance of the procedure himself. He didn't trust that the elder speedster fully understood what would happen. There was always a chance learning about the drawbacks of cursed blood from the horse's mouth so to speak would impact his decision. Ida-san, Izuku said, drawing the hospitalized speedster's attention, I need to know that you truly understand what will happen if we do this, and what could happen. Most importantly, I need to know you accept what will not happen. Now everyone was paying attention. Silently, Izuku, requested Tensaida's file. Once Dr. Gshi handed it over, the Verdanet studied the extent of the crippled pro hero's injuries. What he found gave him pause. It's true that my quirk can heal any damage that is organic in nature, but your quirk replaces parts of your musculature and skeletal structures with what is understood as bio machinery, Izuku said after a moment, stating the obvious, to begin. He received nods of from his audience. While a part of your body, grown from your tissue and all that, they are essentially inorganic apparatuses once formed. Now that the manifestations of your engine have been damaged, there's a possibility that cursed blood won't recognize them as something that needs to be fixed. My quirk might ignore yours. But but. Shiroki blurted, blushing, hotly when all eyes turned to her. She shrank into herself, as if instinctually afraid of such attention. Even if he can't use his quirk quirk anymore, he'll be able to lead a normal life. Right? Attempting to ease the young woman's sudden bout of nerves, Izuku gave her a small smile, which she hesitantly returned. Theoretically, the Verdana said, putting his own hope into his words, yes, even if engine is ignored, the damaged organic tissue will still be recognized and healed. The small assurance went a long way in allowing the members of the Ida family to relax. Even if the worst came to pass and Ingenium couldn't be brought back, Tensaida would live on. That being said, Izuku continued, regaining the room's attention. I don't call it cursed blood for nothing. Its healing isn't something that should be taken lightly. It'll heal all damage it finds, sure, but it does nothing to neutralize pain as it does so. The blank looks he received almost caused Izuku to curse out loud. He'd suffered the drawback of cursed blood for his entire life, feeling every injury twice over. This facet of his quirk had been such a constant that he'd grown to accept it, developing a far higher pain tolerance than most would ever conceive of. At this point, he must make it appear to the outside observer as if he felt nothing as his healing kicked in. And so far, the people he'd healed with his quirk, 
those still alive anyway, had all been caught at the moment of their injury, still in the throes of that initial pain. Su Chan had still been impaled and suffering blood loss, she hadn't been capable of noticing more pain when she'd been healed. Aizawa Sensei had just been mauled almost to death, his body also in shock and unable to differentiate or recognize the pain of healing as separate from the Namu's attack. Only his mother's heart attack had been different in a way. His absolute fear in losing his oldest and most assured support had kicked cursed blood into overdrive, the quirk going so far above and beyond healing it had literally healed away the wear and tear of time. In the moment, however, his mother had been unconscious, so who could say what turning back the clock had felt like for her? That being said, she did complain at random times that her chest would feel oddly constricted. In any case, this would be the first time as Yuka would be, healing a wound that had already, if however minutely, begun to heal on its own. Ten Saida had not only suffered massive injuries, and unimaginable agony, but said trauma had also happened days ago. Relatively speaking, he'd never attempted to treat such an old injury before. It's alright, Tensai replied, stealing his tired visage as much as he could. I can handle the pain. As you could grit his own teeth at such a foolhardy response, he knew for a fact the elder speedster had no idea what awaited him. Can we take that as your official, verbal agreement? Baru asked, stepping forward. The Ida family might have been known, and well respected, for its honor, but they were still human. The frog woman wasn't about to allow anyone a loophole that would give them the means to take advantage of her soon-to-be son-in-law. She wouldn't, stand for anyone pressuring him into becoming their own private doctor. Yes, Tensai replied again with as much conviction as he could muster. I understand the risks, the side effects, and consent. No one would ever be able to say the elder Ida son had no dignity even in his injured state. Then. Let's begin, as Yuku said, relenting. It was time for business then. We don't have, bam. The doors to, Tensai's room were slammed open hard enough to crack the glass in them, courtesy of the visible zombie girl who couldn't care less about locks or privacy arrangements. Gah. Tay groaned out in protest clearly taking offense at the idea of being separated from her master. So sorry boss. Saki apologized a moment later, arms clearly straining to hold back her undead sister and failing, spectacularly. Tae-chan is just too strong. Lily lamented, pouting as she was seen hugging onto one of the legs of the incense travnet. As the members of the Ida family paled at the sight of the undead intruder, the heaven canceller only stood idly by taking mental notes. Barring the rather simplistic behavior of the tall Ravnet, he could see no sign of deteriorating intelligence or physicality in the undead trio. Nor could he see any lack of humanity in their eyes or behavior. Izuku sighed yet again. This was why he didn't want to spend too much time on this endeavor. None of his partners exactly took being away from him very well. Especially Tae Chan. One da escalation later. The legendary Heaven Canceller had expected many things to come from today's developments, but even, his wealth of experience hadn't prepared him for this. The young Midoriya had requested only a few mundane items and space to work. Additionally, he and the pair of fierce mothers at his back had demanded no recordings to be made of the procedure. It had been a perfectly understandable demand, of course, but he'd still made it clear that he would be present to observe and take notes. Ten Saida, was still his patient after all and his health was his responsibility. Once that had been settled, all non-essential persons had been ordered to leave the room. The blonde zombie, Saki if he'd heard right, had been ordered to guard the door. The young Midoriya had warned there would probably be noise during the procedure and it was imperative that no one interrupt the process under any circumstances. The littlest zombie had accompanied the pair of mothers out, offering moral support of all things to the women. The tall Ravnet, however. That one had remained by the Verdanet side. The elderly doctor now stood, in childlike wonder, as the young necromancer began working his magic with only a single 10 milliliter syringe. The blood is life, is Yuku intoned, jabbing the empty, syringe into his arm. Slowly but surely he filled the instrument with his blood. 
it is energy and power. By accepting my blood, my gift, my curse, you entrust your flesh to me. Dr. Gshi had seen many an obscure procedure meant to heal over the years, but this had to be the closest he'd ever been to an actual ritual. The goosebumps he felt prickling along his skin made the elderly man feel as if he were closer to the unholy rather than a potential miracle in the making. Now, let my gift flow through you. Is Yuku continued, taking the now full syringe and plunging it into Tensai's back, close to the worst of his spinal damage. Let the blood repair what is broken. Watching wordlessly as the young necromancer pulled the now empty syringe out of his patient only to jab his own arm with it, again, Dr. Gshi had to honestly work to suppress a shiver. He knew, intellectually, that this would help Tensai, he really did. But he was discovering that the sight of watching the Verdane at work just gave him the creeps. Not to mention seeing the blatant reuse of a syringe made every medical instinct he had cringe. It was only his trust in cursed blood's nature that kept his concerns, regarding contamination at bay. Now, is Yuku intoned, plunging the syringe back into Tensai's back for a second dose, let my curse be your blessing. Let its hunger devour your ills. Twice more the Verdane had applied doses of his blood to the injury Dita, and while observing, the Heaven Cancellor pondered, using his quirk in such a way. It made it difficult to classify Midoriya as a simple mutant, type. By and large, mutants weren't in the same conscious control of their quirks as emitter and transformation types were per se, people with animal mutations like the Asui for example, couldn't not look like frogs, although they could control how they used their body's abnormalities. And yet, Dr. Gshi could very easily see how the boy's chanting could be taken as him giving specific orders to his quirk, guiding it to do his bidding outside of his own body. It made sense, however, when one considered the three undead Midoriya had already raised. The trio could act independently from what he'd witnessed, yet were also obedient to the Verdanet. Although, yet again, the manipulation aspect, or was it control question mark didn't fit with most recorded mutant types. Actually, thinking, further, Dr. Gshi realized that most aspects of Midoriya's quirk didn't fit. Now, Tensaida, steal yourself for the trials to come. And never forget. Is Yuku said, tone growing harsher as he spoke pushing against his own deep-seated desire to not exert control over others. You are reborn by the blood, made whole by the blood, and will be undone by the blood. Fear the cursed blood. The heaven, Cancellor blinked at that last bit. There had been some bite behind those words. Unfortunately, there was no time for further pondering because, Gha'a. It was at that moment that Tensaida screamed with all that he had. Such a sudden and violent reaction from his patient had the Heaven Cancellor jolting into action, but before he could even make it a step closer to the two younger men, in the room, Tensai began to thrash around. When what? How? Dr. Gshi sputtered, shocked. He'd known Midoriya's quirk could heal, but this. Tensai's spine had been so damaged he shouldn't have been able to move at all this soon after his attack. This can't, Gyuaa. Nuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuuu
pushing him into action. My patient is suffering. What is happening? Can't you do something? This is the exact same thing I go through every time I use my quirk, is Yuku replied, trembling smile giving away just how much the Verdanet wished he could actually do something about Tensai's suffering. He'll have to endure it, just like I do. He said he was ready. The Heaven Cancellor grimaced, stepping back but keeping an eye on Tensai's writhing form. He didn't think the young necromancer was lying, and to demand anything else would have been not only folly but ignorant. He well remembered the first year's sports festival, the Verdanet had experienced his fair share of this sort of pain and suffering. Gah! With a final scream of pure tortured anguish, Tensai did the unthinkable. Crunching inward, the writhing man kicked out and threw himself into a standing position, off the table and away from the place his mind had, subconsciously connected with his unending pain. Instantly, Tay moved to shield his Yuka from this unexpected development. The undead Ravnet was more than ready to send the still screaming man back to bed if necessary with a well placed punch. Dr. Gshi could only stare and slack jaw doll. That regeneration. It had happened too fast. Even the most explosive of healing quirks known to science, took weeks, at the very least, to fully recover wounds of such a delicate nature. The spine was one of the few parts of the human body that could be detrimentally affected by even the smallest of distractions when being restored. But. This quirk. Soon, even Tensai himself noticed that he was standing again. The man's screams of agony were soon mixed with hysterical laughter more fit for a manic, though he could have cared less. He'd overcome the impossible, no amount of pain would ever make him feel less joyful about his recovery. He was standing. He could still feel his spine being severed, the flaring, searing pain that bit into his very soul, but at the same time, it felt like he was being reborn. The longer he stood there, the longer it seemed as if every sense was being heightened, this is. Dr. Gchi murmured, too stunned to continue, he couldn't believe his eyes. Had he really stumbled across the medical world's philosopher's stone? Had he found a true, living panacea? Instantly, the elderly doctor sobered from his dazed thinking. This wasn't a newly discovered compound, or a non-sentient organism. Is Yuku Midoriya was an individual dammit. Even ignoring for a moment the incredibly unethical methods that would be needed to harness the boy's quirk against his will, he was only that, one boy. The world was vast, full of people in need. There was no future in even considering young Midoriya as a cure-all. It was young Midoriya's decision if he wanted to use his power for the good of the world, just as it was his right to be free of demands for his blood, whether they be for science or healing. Quite impressive. The Heaven Cancellor finished lamely, restraining his tongue from slipping. The quirk might not have been a true panacea, but he wouldn't lie to himself and say he wasn't curious to study cursed blood for himself anyway. He could only hope that the hero in Genium would be responsible and restrain himself in the same way. Thirty minutes later, Tensaida had finally calmed down. After enduring both, overwhelmingly mind-breaking pain and the heartfelt euphoria of feeling his feet and being able to walk again, the firstborn of the Ida family had understandably been far beyond the ability to focus or reason with. It hadn't bothered Izuku overly much, however. He'd never had to fear becoming crippled before, so he gave the elder brother of his classmate all the time he needed. With the situation, now calm, the rest of the Ida family were allowed to re-enter the room. Unfortunately for the young necromancer, this meant his ordeal would be far from over. Midoriya San, Tenya said, absent any of his normal volume or antics, was it really necessary to make my brother suffer so much? We could hear him from down the hall. While there had been no actual bite to the words, the young speedster's eyes were enough to denote his true emotions regarding the ordeal. Izuku, once more, could only sigh. I never hid the fact that my quirk doesn't nullify pain during healing, the Verdet said in response. He crossed his arms far past done with this whole afternoon now. If you chose to ignore that fact, well, that's not my problem now is it? I, what, did you think the boss never felt all the times, 
You and the others hit him with everything you puny wimps had. Saki spat, cutting off Tenya before he could even try and respond. The blonde was visibly pissed. To her, it was simple. If you chose to cause pain, no matter the reason, you had no right to complain when on the receiving end. She'd messed up plenty of her opponents over the years whenever she got in a fight, but she'd never given any lip about her own injuries in return. And this softy, weak as he was, was training to be a hero. Let it go, Tenya, Tensai said, intervening before any blow-up could happen. The elder speedster shook slightly, random bouts of ghostly pain still remembered by his raw nerves. I accepted the risks, all of them. I'm the one responsible here for whatever my screaming did to you all. As he spoke, the man held his soon-to-be wife tighter, the shy Roki woman squeezing back just as tightly. The two had hardly separated since she'd been allowed back in the room. Speaking of risks, the room fell silent as Izuku stepped forward, staring solemnly at the man he'd just healed. His original plan had been to attempt to emulate what he'd done with his mother, leaving no trace of control within Tensai to ensure his freedom. Saki had quickly, if unintentionally, slapped him soon after with a second thought. You know what I'd do after getting back on my feet from sheet like this? I'd go find the mother forker who thought they could put me in the ground and beat their ass to a pulp. There were no grounds to compare Ingenium's attitude to Saki's, but he couldn't take the risk Tenya's brother was less honorable than his classmate had always proclaimed. For a time, his blood would be enhancing the elder speedster, and it would be far too easy for Tensai to decide a second chance at Stain was too good to pass up. So, as disgusting as it made him feel, he'd come to his decision. For the good of Ingenium and the Ida family, he'd exert his control on the downed hero. Tensai Ida, Izuku spoke, the name carrying a weight even those not imbued with the verdette scork could feel. You are not to seek out the villain known as the hero killer Stain, for any reason. Nor are you to allow your brother any opportunity to find him either. The quiet lasted only a moment longer, a single second of confusion. Ten Saida's red eyes seemed to glow behind his sharp, athlete's glasses. Understood, the elder speedster said plainly, nodding once. I'll distance myself, and my family, from the case completely. Tanya shot to his feet, a look of utter betrayal on his face. Midoriya. A gaze of burning scarlet met the younger speedster's glare, utterly overwhelming his inept anger and silencing him. Can you tell us, to our faces, with the honor of your family on the line, that you weren't plotting on, getting revenge? Buru asked suddenly, putting the younger Rita in the spotlight. She then turned toward the elder. Can you? Both sons of the Ida family reacted differently to the biding question. I cannot, Tensai said, looking down, a look of guilty shame drawing a deep frown across his face. I had already been contemplating new strategies, even before Midoriya agreed to heal me, for Aiton to utilize that would have allowed my agency a better chance at catching the hero killer. Meanwhile, Tenya only looked back stone-faced, unwilling to express just what he'd been planning to do in regards to the hero killer. The everyday citizen wouldn't have blamed either brother for their thoughts, it was human nature after all. Feelings of vengeance, of needing to complete a job left undone, they, were commonly felt the world over. Please understand, Izuku said, begging for those present to recognize why he felt he had to impose his will in this situation. He felt horrible for doing it, but knew it was for the best in this circumstance. It's for your own safety. He defeated Ingenium once, but left him alive. We can't give him a reason to make sure he finishes the job if there were a next time. Tenya swallowed thickly through the emotions roiling behind his blank mask, but succeeded in not pushing the issue further. He had entertained the idea of hunting Stain down himself, but now that cooler heads had prevailed common sense was returning. His idol, Ingenium, his older brother, had fallen victim to the villain. What had he possibly thought he'd do against such a monster? Young, Midoriya, Dr. Gshi called out, feeling the room's turmoil was dying down, could you answer a few of my questions please? As a consummate medical professional, 
someone who always put the health of his patients first above all else, the heaven canceller had more than a few questions. From what cursed blood could really do, to what kind of complications could arise from the Verdinette imposing, some sort of remote influence on Tensaida, he wanted to ask it all. No, Izuku replied bluntly, not even sparing the elderly man a second look before moving to exit the room. In the brief moment it took him to return to the hallway, the young necromancer found himself pleasantly surprised that the renowned doctor didn't move an inch after his refusal. The famous doctor allowed him to leave, without saying another word, didn't try to stop him, nothing. It was a nice change. Closely flanked by Tei and Saki, Izuku stepped into the hall, prepared for whoever else might have heard the screaming of 10th Saida and wondered who was being murdered inside to come looking. Initially seeing no one, the Ferdinand leaned back against the wall, listening into the room he'd just left. He could hear, the adults resume talking, mostly Baru going through a veritable tidal wave of legalities. He sighed at the necessity of such a thing. He'd done a good deed damn it, why was the chance of potentially painful backlash so high? Would Tensai respect the agreement beyond what control forced him to? Would he spill the bins to the media under enough pressure? What about Denya? His classmate had at first, looked incensed over how he'd controlled his brother, and then he'd gone stony afterward. And that didn't even consider the reactions of the women involved. Izuni- Lily murmured, coming up to Izuku from. Wait, where had Lily gone? Shaking his head from the shot of it was realizing he'd lost track of one of his partners for a moment, he flinched as he gazed into big, watery crimson orbs, there's. There's a kid next door. He's hurting bad. Saying no had come easier to Izuku in recent weeks. He'd found he'd needed to pull his heart off his sleeve and keep it close as the world grew ever more judgmental and castigating against him. To protect himself and those he cared for, he couldn't be the idealistic. Oh who was he kidding, how could he say no to that weaponized cuteness, all right Lily, let's see this kid. Even tired and mentally exhausted as he was. Izuku Midoriya couldn't fool himself. He'd always push that little bit further, go that little bit plus ultra, to help someone in need. Here, Lily said, opening the nearby door quickly. No longer was she her normal, loud self. Now, the Bluenet was more self-contained than Izuku had ever seen her. Inside the room next, to Tensaida's, there was indeed a small child. The boy, appearing to be about Lily's age in appearance, laid on his bed looking absolutely awful, drawing ragged breaths that could be seen to visibly rattle his tiny frame and drench his face in cold sweat for the effort, suffering was too light a word to describe what the youngster was forced to endure. And it was made all the worse for the fact that not only was the boy awake, but entirely lucid as well. It was as if something, or someone, had made it so he would be conscious for the entirety of his dormant. What happened to you little one? Izuku asked tenderly, gingerly approaching the bed with hands opened and, raised. He knew the chances of the kid talking to a stranger were small, or should be if he'd been taught right by his family, but it was too late now. He couldn't do nothing in the face of such agony. Sure enough, the boy only stared back at Izuku in silence, too tired to glare but clearly unwilling to speak to a strange person who'd just walked into his room. Oi, oi. Saki hissed, eyes blazing, through the files on a clipboard at the end of the boy's bed. Says here some asshole villain poisoned him. What a forking bastard a gh. Instantly, Tay elbowed Saki in the ribs. Instantly, Saki went flying into the wall, embedding into the drywall. Izuku, however, had heard exactly what he'd needed to understand the situation. There'd been a villain attack yesterday. The criminal in question had, been a mutant type, born with a scorpion-like tail and various kindness plates along his body. While quickly stopped, a few local heroes and civilians had been stung. The news report hadn't said anything about a miner being one of the victims, though, much less that the venom's effects were so drastic. Do you want to stop hurting? Izuku asked, voice calm and smile constrained to a gentle upturn, of his lips. He was already digging around in his pockets for another empty syringe. Beside him, 
Lily gave a fairly cute smile herself, looking back and forth between potential patient and her big brother. The child nodded weakly, all he could manage. His tired mind could only dimly focus through the constant pain that had become his entire reality since that shitty villain had stung him. Just, then, he faintly remembered the words of his aunt. She'd always told him that one day he'd meet someone who'd become his hero, who would change his view on the garbage profession that had taken his parents from him. If this strange guy surrounded by weird-looking girls could keep his word and take away his pain, truly be the villain that none of the doctors or heroes out there had been able to. Then. Then maybe he'd be able to do it. Maybe he'd be able to recognize him as a real hero. His hero. Well then, you only have to promise me one thing, is Yuku said, merely making conversation as he found what he'd been looking for and pulled a syringe from his bottomless pockets. Without even flinching, he stabbed into the thick vein in the crook of his arm. You gotta be a good kid until the next, time we meet okay? As the emerald necromancer pulled the syringe out and effortlessly injected its crimson treasure into the unknown kid, a mischievous thought rose to the surface of his mind. He was only barely able to hold back the grin that threatened to peek out. He wondered what the looks on everyone's faces would be if they realized all his chanting wasn't necessary. Outside the rooms of, Ten Saida and the unknown child, a woman with a cherubic face and long green hair stepped out of the elevator at the end of the hallway, her slumped form radiating waves of desperation and sorrow. A not at all silent curse left the woman as she hissed at the traffic that had delayed her arrival. Her nephew, adoption be damned, had been suffering in unimaginable agony due to the inadequacy of the so-called heroes who'd been present at the moment of the villain attack yesterday, and there was nothing she or her family could do to help him. Even worse, he'd been left all alone in this unfamiliar hospital for ages now. A transference into the care of the infamous Heaven Cantler was a double-edged sword, she very well knew. It meant the patient wouldn't die, thankfully, but in the same vein, such a drastic measure meant that very same patient would have perished under any other care. It was a Hail Mary if she'd ever seen one. And, thanks to all the goddamn governmental bureaucracy with the HPSC, she and the others hadn't been informed of their nephew's transfer until long after the fact, not before. She'd been the one closest to the Heaven Cancellor's current hospital, so she'd cancelled everything she'd had to and booked it here to support her family. Walking out of the elevator, the green at its teeth grit as she felt her blood boil the longer she thought of her family's tragic situation. The damn villain, even now, was being a heartless bastard, prolonging their suffering. He swore up and down he could deactivate the venom coursing through her nephew's veins, and the veins of, all those others he'd stung. Of course, such magnanimity would come at a price. With her nephew and a dozen other people's lives as his bargaining chips, the scorpion villain was demanding not only his freedom, but a full pardon. The bastard claimed that it was only fair, seeing as how he'd been wrongfully discriminated against by a bigoted pro-hero while minding his own business at the farmer's market the attack had occurred at. Whether that story was true or not, Tomoko Shirtoko, better known to the world at large as the heroine Ragdoll, could have cared less at the moment. Why? The greenet sniffed wiping away a straight tear as she glanced at the signs hanging from the ceiling to orient herself on the new floor. She'd never been to this hospital before and it was kind of a maze. Why'd, it have to be Coda? Truth be told, a large part of her own misery was an unhealthy level of guilt. Coda hadn't even wanted to go out yesterday. It had been herself and the rest of the wild wild pussycats who'd all had differing plans that would have left the brooding orphan alone. Since that was always a no-go, she and Tiger, who'd had a demonstration at the plaza around which the farmer's market was held, had been tasked with taking their shared nephew along with them. He'd been meant to stay at the playground nearby, within eyesight, hopefully find some kids his age to play with. He'd been meant to be safe. And then it had turned into a gigantic disaster. She felt so bad. It physically hurt to consider Kota might die because she'd taken him with her and she hadn't been able to keep him, safe. But no matter how badly Tomoko felt, she knew her partner Mandalay, Shino Sozaki, had it so much worse. 
Kota was her actual nephew, the last blood family she had left. Okay. It should be around here. Tomoko murmured, checking off incorrect rooms as she wandered down the hall. She steeled herself. She might have mentally known how bad Kota's state was, but she knew from experience that actually, seeing him hurting would break her heart. That was a quick one boss. A harsh voice snarked as a small group exited one of the rooms a few doors down from Tomoko's location. The strange unit consisted of a blonde with multicolored highlights, a tall ravnet, and a cute little brunette, all being led by a gently smiling Verdanet. I wasn't going to prolong his suffering, the boy replied, clearly, satisfied with whatever he'd done in the room. A low groan followed. Lily agrees. The brunette child quickly added. It was only after she'd passed the group that Tomoko realized where the quartet had just exited and years of training instantly kicked in. They'd just left Koda's room. Instincts going haywire, the pro heroine activated her quirk, throwing a wide mental net over the whole floor, before meticulously working backward to the fore she was focused. Their words. The fear throbbing through her heart. It all painted a horrible picture in her panicking mind. And. And she wasn't in any way bad already. Her quirk, Surge, was incredibly useful and potent, that had never been in doubt. The ability to not only keep track of multiple targets within her range but also discern their weaknesses and or injuries was incredible for hero work. However, what few people knew, was that she needed a certain amount of baseline information before her powers could work to their fullest. If she didn't have a point of reference for a condition or state of being, for example if she'd never seen a burn victim before or read about frostbite, then search as many mental quirks were known to, do, would use symbolic approximations for her mind to understand the unknown information she was picking up. In the case of that hypothetical burn victim, she might have seen a person surrounded by fire sprites, or with frostbite the affected limbs being gripped by phantasmal Yukiana. Right now. What? Ragdoll squawked through her mindscape as she used search to look at the group behind her. I can't. I can't read those three. Coming up blank when reading other people was nearly an impossibility when it came to search. Over the years, Tomoko had found that her quirk could even pick up the life signs of the quirkless, faint as they'd be. In fact, the only cases she could recall of not being able to read people were those with mentally defensive quirks. And those who were dead. Then, she focused on the single male of the group, the one life sign she could see. Instantly, search balked in her head, Tomoko blinking her mental eyes as behind the boy, a floating, winged figure rose, clinging to his neck. The figure's wings were pure white, only their tips appearing to be dripping a crimson liquid that never quite seemed to completely fall. Likewise, the figure's robe was, splattered with crimson, though the impression the green it got was that the figure had bled the liquid that stained it. She couldn't understand, and that frightened her. It had been years since she couldn't at some level recognize what search showed her, though she didn't turn around, Tomoko realized the quartet must have reached the elevator, because the group stopped, still chatting amongst themselves and not paying her any mind. Except for the figure clinging over the boy. Ever so slowly, the winged figure turned around to stare directly at her. Tomoko felt her blood freeze. The creature had no face. Its featureless head only sported two things, a pair of glowing crimson eyes. As a pro heroine, Tomoko knew it was her duty to follow the boy with the monster over his shoulder. She knew it was her job to learn what he really was, if he was a threat. But. Koda. Tomoko's shout would have been deafening had anyone been in the hall to hear it. Faster than she'd ever run before, the greenette dashed to her nephew's room, mine racing at what? nightmarish sights she could be about to see. She threw the door open, and found something that would forever change her way of thinking. Koda? Tomoko couldn't believe her eyes. Her nephew, who she'd seen yesterday as too weak to even stand under his own power, was now standing, looking out his room's window without a care, or pain, in the world. It was a miracle. But. It hadn't been the work of. The Heaven Cancellor. According to the briefing Shino had given the rest of the team, 
the legendary doctor hadn't been scheduled to visit the boy until later that day. That meant. Auntie Tomoko? Koda questioned, turning around to look at his normally hyperactive aunt, who now sounded slightly out of breath and terrified for some reason. Tomoko didn't even gasp at the sight of the unnaturally red, eyes that stared back at her. Their existence didn't change the fact that her nephew had seemingly been saved. Rushing forward, the emotional greenet embraced the boy who meant so much to her and her family, incoherently mumbling blessings and apologies. As she squeezed the ever-loving life out of her nephew, Tomoko made a silent promise, just because she couldn't understand something Search, showed her, and the interpretation was frightening in appearance, she would never again judge it as evil or menacing without first making an effort to understand what she was being shown. An Andy. Koda sputtered, nearly choking as he lightly returned the enthusiastic embrace. For the first time since his parents had been taken from him, he actually felt happy to be with his family. I think. I, think I found my hero. Two days later, UA main campus, 1A's homeroom classroom. Izuka found himself to be experiencing an odd occurrence, that being he was feeling conflicting emotions. The Ida family had honored their promises in full. From paying his meal at a rather humble restaurant to not revealing his involvement in Ingenium's recovery, no term had been too large or too little to be, ignored. As far as the media at large knew, the Turbo Hero had been treated by the infamous Heaven Cancellor, owing his miraculous recovery largely to the elderly doctor being allowed to treat him from the comfort of his own home. The last official word from the Ida Press associate had been that Tensai's status was out of danger, but no details had been given. While Tensai was still under the compulsion of control, the rest of the family was not. They could have easily betrayed him if they'd felt the inclination. And judging by the occasional glare Tenya would send him at random times. But that wasn't all that was on his mind of course. There was his fame amongst the other UA students. The newest addition to 1A, Hitoshi Shinso, had quickly fallen in with his group and become a good, friend. The insomniac Violet even shared the occasional lunch with him alongside the now much more cheerful Kanoko Mori from Class 1B. The mushroom-themed girl had bothered Tsai at first, as you could knew, but within a single day, the brunette had proven she meant no harm to anyone, or the frog girl's relationship with him. Unfortunately, there were many more students who were just as likely to give him fearful looks mixed with the occasional glare. Itsuka Kendo, also of Class 1B, was a prime example of this development. Though she remained cordial at all times, it wasn't hard for even the most oblivious to see the friction between the redhead and the verdanet. On the flip side, the staff at UA thankfully maintained their strict neutrality. All in all, it was a jumble for him. There was a sort of good deed with a dash of guilt, continued anonymity, potential aggression from a classmate, new friends, definite future aggression from a member of his sister class, and life as usual at school. He wasn't quite sure how to feel about everything. Sit, Aizawa ordered out flatly as he slouched into Class 1A's classroom. Without looking at his students instantly complying, he began to fiddle with a small device in his hands. And be quiet. Today there's something important for us to discuss. There were many times, for all their usefulness in keeping him alive, Shouda hated his instincts. Just as he'd felt the day leading up to the USJ attack, today too he'd felt like skipping class and boycotting the curriculum. Something terrible was going to happen, he just knew it. No matter, his warnings, Nezu and the rest of the first year teachers had pressed on though. The hero internship program was still going to happen. After the attack, he'd planned on pushing to cancel the program this year. Really, he didn't feel comfortable letting his students, who'd already experienced a life and death situation before even half of their first year in school, out into the world at the moment. Keeping them on campus and bringing pro heroes to them would have been much more logical and safe. Your participation in the sports festival is, was, and always will be first and foremost a way for you all to gain an amount of controlled exposure, Aizawa said, 
purposefully avoiding the word safe along with a certain Ravnet zombie girl glaring at the back of his head. This exposure, in, turn, allows agencies to gather the data they need to make requests for these. Hero internships. Finally getting the device to work, Aizawa pressed a button and the screen at the front of the room lit up. Izuku, meanwhile, blinked in confusion. Internships? Of course, he knew the program existed, that wasn't the problem. As the classroom around him began to devolve into a den of noise, the Verdana couldn't help but question the wisdom behind this seemingly flippant decision. After the near disaster at the USJ, after the absolute circus that had been the first year's tournament, wouldn't it have been smarter to cancel internships and keep the students on campus? While all participating agencies have stated that your safety will be guaranteed, I will remind you that the logical option with the current societal climate would be to stay on campus and receive more one-on-one -on -one lessons from a teacher of your choice, Aizawa continued, uncaring of the reprimand he knew he'd probably face for his words later. Don't be fooled by how generous these agencies appear to be on paper. Remember, the choice is still yours. The inflection of clear disdain in the underground hero's tone, clued Izuku in on the real reason the internship program was still happening. It was about the money. Plus ultra genius or not, Nezu couldn't print the school funds from thin air, legally, and after the show at the end of the tournament, quite a few sponsors had withdrawn their support for UA it wasn't quite at the level of dire straits, but Izuku knew very well he shoulders some of the responsibility for UA current financial woes. He didn't feel at fault, of course, just responsible. Normally, the requests are rather spread out, Aizawa explained, clicking another button to switch the screen from blank to a display of a graphic with a few familiar faces on it with solid bars growing next to them from left to right. Numbers popped up at the end of the bars, counting. But this, year they are much more directly related to how much you impressed certain individuals. At this, murmurs broke out amongst the students of 1A, many noticing a clear discrepancy between success in the festival and the number of requests on the screen. For one, Midoriya, the champion himself, was at the near bottom of the list with only six requests to his name. The young ladies of the class, to add, one, all had gained an average of 20 offers each. The young men, meanwhile, were much more spread out, with some like Denny obtaining over 50 while Kamenari only received two. Think carefully about where you want to spend your internships. You have until the end of the week to submit your choice, Aizawa finished, pulling packets of offers from somewhere. And don't forget, remaining on campus is a valid choice. As the gruff teacher began to hand out their offers, Izuku quickly noticed something. He'd been skipped. If Hitoshi hadn't been skipped as well, he might have worried more forkery was going on, but the Violet's included exclusion only made him curious. Wanna bet on the reason for the skip boss? Saki asked with a smirk. My money's on all the options were either horrible or, obviously traps. Grugleg. Te groaned in response, making Izuku snort as he scratched his head at the rather colorful suggestion the Ravnet had made. Lily has a bad feeling. The blue net whispered, hoping the twisting feeling in her gut was wrong. It only took a few minutes for all of the hard copies of 1A's offers to be passed out, is Yuku and Hitoshi still without a single application, once all the packets had appeared to be handed out, and the class saw Aizawa head to his desk and shuffle through some paperwork, the murmurs really began. How did Shinzo not get a single offer? Shinso? How did Midoriya not get anything? He won the whole festival. Do you think they're not allowed to be interns? I mean, they're quirks. Shut your mouth. You sound like a quirkist. No, no, think about it. What agency would risk their popularity on, Midoriya? Shinso. Aizawa's flat tone cut through the whispers completely, leaving the classroom in total silence. The two offer less students stood and walked to the gruff teacher's desk. Unseen by the two but noted by their gruff teacher were the looks being sent their way behind their backs. Concern. Confusion. Distrust. While the two of you did receive, requests along with everyone else, 
You also caught the attention of an international agency, Azawa revealed, causing the classroom to instantly erupt into an entirely new kind of silence. It was decided that it would be in your best interest if, until you can meet with the agency's official liaison tomorrow, your local offer is beheld back. This is a rare honor, and we, your teachers, wanted you, to have every chance to consider all your options on a level playing field. Rare indeed. In the history of UA as you could could only think of one past hero course student who'd ever managed to be selected for an internship outside of the country's borders, All Might. The top hero had been impressive enough even before his debut that he'd caught the attention of an American agency. Before him, it was, unheard of for agencies to basically almost try to poach up and come in hero hopefuls from other countries. Message delivered. Aizawa gestured for the two boys to return to their seats. As they did so, both nearly froze at the looks they were now receiving from their classmates. Not once to be overly dramatic, they totally didn't see the other students of 1A as black silhouettes with only hungry, glowing eyes staring at them under interrogative spotlights. Nope. Not at all. This isn't going to be a bad thing. Is it? Lily asked. Worry furrowing the blueness brow. Don't jinx us, shrimpy. Saki warned, serious for once on the heels of this new revelation. Beside her sisters, Tay only considered the motes of dust in the air and silence, content with whatever it would be that is Yuka wanted, Omake, the impact. UA Sports Festival was an event broadcast and viewed by millions every year as a means of entertainment. For some, however, it was a window in the future a way for those with a discerning eye to discover just who would be shaping the next generation, who would be charged with protecting their hard-fought peace in a decade or so. Each year of students offered their own merits, to be observed, but this particular year, the first year festival took the cake. It had taken a direction that few could have ever imagined. A mutant was leading. Leading. Not only was the student a mutant type, but rumors were already spreading like wildfire that he was a degenerative dark mutant as well. But that hardly changed the fact that he was essentially winning the first year festival at, the moment. Heavens above. A man with avian features mixed in with his otherwise human head exclaimed as he watched the festival from his beaten up television, he's amazing. That's the determination of a real hero right there for you. The world watched on as the somewhat plain boy with green hair broke out of some sort of mind control set upon him by his exhausted looking opponent. It wasn't, exactly that mutants didn't stand a chance in events like this, nor was it that a mutant type had never reached so far into one of UA festivals before either. But it was rare. Especially when the competition included rising stars like the Totoraki Saiyan. Nothing like those fake pros that bail at the first sign of bullets flying, a young man with a reptilian build grumbled to himself in his, locked bedroom as he watched the same green-haired boy take a hard punch to the face but continue to fight on. He doesn't quit, no matter what. Like a real hero. I wonder why we don't see this kind of determination from our brothers and sisters more often. And why isn't he using all his undead beasts? The truth was that many simply found it more profitable and less troublesome to only, showcase emitters instead of transformation or mutant types. That quirkist ideal was deeply ingrained, even in bastions such as UA is that. Is that. A girl with the head of a snake stammered as she watched on in shock as the same green-haired boy who'd carried through victorious despite the odds against him mercilessly pummeled a vine-haired girl with the help of one of his undead companions. Datsu Chan's boyfriend. Habuko Mongoose hadn't been able to visit her dear friend since they'd finished middle school, but the two had managed to keep in touch through a mix of emails and texting sessions. The snake-headed girl hadn't been able to keep from voicing her jealousy when her froggy friend had bluntly revealed, as was her nature, that she'd managed to nail down the great boyfriend, seemingly out of nowhere. But now, now she struggled on what exactly she wanted to text her longtime friend. Maybe he's actually really nice and caring outside of combat situations? Habuko reasoned to no one as she looked pleadingly at her phone for answers, eyes flicking through message after message from Tsup raising her Izukun before landing back on the ominous image of a red-eyed demon, 
absolutely obliterating his opponent. That's got to be it, right? She wouldn't lie about something like that, right? A mutant type surviving a UA festival's competition until the tournament was nothing new. It happened every year. Seeing those same mutant types make it through to the second round of matches was rare, though not unheard of. The monster of UA however, had not only survived the, traditionally first fight of the underdogs, but he was now destroying the remaining competition. His medal against the Man of Steel had been a sight to see, catching the attention of not only the Japanese public, but people the world over. Once they'd tuned in, his recounting of the unfair conditions he'd been forced to accept in order to participate, his conviction. It incited them. And seeing him dominate what should have been a much more physically powerful opponent? A pair of bunny ears perked straight up. The words. Those actions. For one muscular bunny woman, it was a moment she'd waited for most of her life. Oh hell forking yeah. Rumi Yuz Ajiyama, better known as the battle mad pro heroine Mirko, roared in delight. Him. I want to fight him. Finally, a brat out of the chethal worth a, damn. Mirko had a reputation, one unlike most other heroes. She was combat focused to the extreme, strong willed and superhumanly powerful for someone with the ostensibly simple mutant quirk of rabbit. Hand in hand with all of that, the pro heroine was incredibly independent, eschewing any sort of aid during missions or patrols, requiring the support of neither man nor woman to carry out her duties. She kept no agency, no sidekick or support company. If she needed her gear fixed, it was rumored she handled the work herself. She'd officially never lost a fight and her rising star was set to eclipse all but the likes endeavor and all might's rise to the top. What only those few truly close to the woman knew, however, is that she was still human. Afraid of being seen as weak, a cute, bunny girl better suited as a trophy wife for some strong or wealthy man to show off, Mirko had closed herself off. In refusing to even suffer the chance of becoming the mascot of a hero agency, She'd struck out on her own right out of hero school. Mirko, in truth, had become strong to shut down the naysayers. She'd become independent to keep anyone from ever turning her into an object. She'd made, it her goal to reach the top because the hierarchy would otherwise never accept their precious emitters being saved by, let alone take orders from, a mutant. But now, this random boy, Izuku Midoriya, was proving to be exactly like her. And for all of her walls and reasons to keep her distance, Yuzajiyama found herself intrigued. Here was a kid fighting an uphill battle, everyone against him trying, to keep him from growing to his full potential. And yet, he still pushed forward, like the inevitability of an avalanche. Now where the hell did that application form go? Yuzajiyama shouted, tearing through her home slash agency. The bunny woman overturned furniture flipped paperwork, and ripped open boxes that had been sealed ever since she'd moved in years ago. Come the fork on. I wouldn't have, tossed the stupid things. Glowing baby, they had you a stamp for crying out loud. As the quirkiest hierarchy saw the rise of an emerald symbol of their deepest nightmares, the world over, mutants young and old found something else that they'd nearly forgotten. Hope for Equality. Chapter 42, Sinister Deal. On this particular day, at this particular time, two high school-aged boys were being guided to, their principal's office. The two of them both held rather infamous reputations, and as they walked by, other students and even a few staff members of the academy ended up whispering amongst themselves. It was a rather common scenario for the two boys to have experienced over their scholastic lives although those observing them now had no way to know the true reasons behind this particular occurrence. G-G-G-G-G-G-G-R-R-R-R-R. Tay's near subvocal growl once again sent a wave of onlooking and whispering students back into their own businesses. Lily agrees, the littlest zombie muttered while still looking around nervously, this isn't right. If they want to look at us so bad. Saki's sharp features began to curl in a truly sadistic manner, then we should do something to truly deserve it. Maybe, break some legs or split some heads. At that loudly stated question, 
The remaining UA students still watching the group headed to the principal's office quickly lowered their eyes, their sudden fear plain to see. While the students of UA with most renown belonged to the hero and support courses, and said students were by and large exemplar by default, the majority of the academy's student body came from its general studies students. These students lacked one or more of the qualities that made heroes what they were, and thus to attend the prestigious school made up for that deficiency by paying the full extent of the school's tuition in return for the doors UA would open for their futures, they weren't made to deal with real threats. Calm down Saki-chan, is Yuku commanded weakly, sounding oddly. Tempted. By the suggestion, you, know very well we can't do that. Even as he said the words, Izuku felt the dark desire to follow his blonde partner's violent words. Sometimes it was hard to ignore the temptation, to resist showing the rest of the bigoted world why it was a bad idea to alienate him, and others like him. But, for now, the deep-seated desire to be a true hero, to protect others and keep them safe, won out against, its inverse brother. Here in the school maybe, Hitoshi Shinso threw out in a hushed voice, if they act up outside campus. That earned a snort from the blonde delinquent. And a wry grin. The staff member guiding the two boys and the undead trio shook his head at the overheard discussion, not in annoyance, but in silent acknowledgement of their situation. The two students hadn't done anything wrong, or that deserved reprimand. In fact, they were being actually acknowledged with far greater accolades than their peers. It was frustrating that the other students immediately jumped to worse conclusions just because he was accompanying them on their way to Nezu's office. Neither of you are in trouble, Aizawa spoke up, unnecessarily loudly for one normally so quiet. Anyone who wasn't an idiot would, immediately realize the underground hero was purposefully making sure those around them those watching and listening to their every move, would hear him. Don't change that fact because of a few wandering eyes and loose tongues. Saki clicked her own tongue, knowing very well that while all five of them heard the warning, she was its specific target. Before anyone could come up with anything else, to say, the group reached UA administration office, which contained the principal's office inside. Walking in, the six were waved on by Nezu's secretary, only stopping when they reached the door at the end of the second hallway. It was a door that both boys knew very well by now. There was little fanfare while the group entered. Aizawa didn't even bother with knocking on the door, it was obvious, from the secretary's actions that they were expected. Principal Nezu. Aizawa spoke as he opened the door to the office proper, eyes habitually scanning the location for threats, exits, the usual. His eyes hardened and Agent Smith. He hadn't expected there to be another person waiting for them, someone he knew better than he might have wished. Hi there, Scruffy. The black-clad woman greeted while, lifting a steaming mug to her lips, glad to see you still have some energy left after all this time. Izuku noticed from the edge of his vision that his teacher's eye twitched at the comment, but he could hardly spare any thought to it due to the sense of dread, he normally felt when in the principal's office seemingly being ratcheted up to the nth degree. The verdant necromancer knew the feeling. The smothering sense of all-consuming terror that only appeared when the Interpol agent was present. If he'd had to take a guess, it was the effect of her quirk, although he still couldn't pinpoint if it was a purely mental stimulus or a pheromone-based emanation. One side-eyed look at his new classmate though. You okay? Izuku asked the violet in a low voice. Hitoshi. Normally monotone to the extreme, currently had his fists balled tightly for all he was worth. It was clear he was fighting his instincts of fight or flight. Although he managed to keep his poker face, the drops of sweat trailing down from his hairline gave away how affected he really was. Don't worry. The sleep-deprived mentalist replied in a surprisingly almost neutral tone, I've had it worse. Behind the two boys, Aizawa blinked in exasperation. This particular smith really was hard to deal with. Era era. Really now little boy? The agent purred as she lowered her shade slightly so her half-lidded gaze could peek out. Tell me more. Is Harrible Chan still her same old merry self back home? 
For such an innocent question, it earned quite the reaction, Hitoshi instantly turning pale as he registered the words, for a split second, he almost gave in and took a step back. Momentarily ignored, Izuku noticed the feeling of dread becoming weightier, almost roiling through air. Stealing his nerves, he managed to reach out and place a supportive, if somewhat shaky, hand on his classmate's shoulder. By the way Hitoshi almost instantly settled, it helped the younger insomniac a lot. Perhaps we should start this, meeting? With Nezu's masterful interruption, the heavy sensation returned to a more manageable level. Agent Smith raised her shades back up, and leaned back, a smile curling across her lips. We do have to consider these young men's education after all, Nezu continued, huffing as, unseen by any of the humans in the room, his hackles slowly unruffled. The longer we take, the more of their classes, they'll miss. And I for one would hate to be the cause for them falling behind. As the principal began to pull out a pile of documents, it didn't escape either teen's notice that the grin adorning the agent's face never wavered. The undead trio picked up on the unusual behavior as well, and suddenly none of the three liked what this meeting could mean for their master. Meanwhile, a main campus. 1A's classroom. Tsu was not jealous, not at all. While 1A's two problem children were taken out of the classroom, so that they could meet with the liaison of the international agency that had taken an interest in them, the rest of the class was left to a period of self-study. It would have been utter chaos if not for the fact that Paper Sensei was going to enter the classroom rather soon. Can, you imagine it? Being scouted by an international agency? Kirishima's awestruck wonder was well deserved. The hardening user showcased his admiration at their classmates feet in his usual way, loudly and with fists pumping. Neither he nor many of the others even tried to hide their curiosity at the possible details. Aizawa Sensei had omitted pretty much everything besides the existence of the agency, from its name to its location of origin. It could be anything, from a famous private practice to the very UN zone Interpol. I certainly hadn't imagined them being picked, Saro added thoughtlessly as he chatted with Denki. I mean, we know Midoriya isn't bad, but to any outsider you have to admit, he must look creepy as all hell. Maybe that's why they were picked. Mina chirped, literally, jumping into the conversation, Midori-kun may only look intimidating if you don't know him, but if you get on his bad side, maybe they need him to take down some sort of supervillain? Oh ah ooh ooh. Maybe. And if that's the case, then that Shinso guy may be going along to keep that supervillain under control. Tar threw in her two yen, come to think of it. Those two working together sounds kinda. Overkill? Don't you think? Tsuru wasn't jealous, she was worried. She and her mother had been given a hint as to who was going to meet her boyfriend. It had terrified her. Interpa was known for recruiting good people with dangerous quirks, it was a truth that most everyday citizens of the world actively ignored. And while the idea of her cinnamon role of a boyfriend finding a place in the world, of heroes was nice. So I couldn't even begin to imagine the sorts of dangers he would be subjected to if he followed that particular path. Or maybe someone finally came to keep the two of them on a tighter leash, Ojiro spat out suddenly, sounding more irritable than usual, like the Psa, or more likely, the SCP Foundation. The moment the second option was mentioned, the temperature in the 1A classroom dropped dramatically. So and several others flinched. Mentioning the BSO would have been bad enough. That particular branch of the UN security force might have only been created due to a USA town being nuked as a result of a bioweapon escaping during the first emergence of quirks, but even after the unscrupulous pharmaceutical enterprise at fault had been shut down, the international agency wielded a great deal of authority in matters that fell under its purview. Most relevant of that authority was the agency's presence in the lives of those with quirks that could potentially be used in some capacity as bioweapons. Those unfortunate souls were forced to obtain certification from the BSA that allowed them to be accepted as active members of society. And even then, the agency, was allowed to openly monitor said individuals for any potential slip-ups. Tsu and her mother knew that Izuka would have to meet the BSA at some point due to cursed blood 
but she deeply wished that said moment could be delayed until it had been extensively proven that Izukun's quirk had no potential as a bio weapon. Then the encounter could hopefully be nothing more than a high buy. Abruptly, Fumikage stood up, his chair screeching as it slid against the floor. If the avian teen had had a quirk that killed with a look, Ojiro would have been dust in the wind. Dark shadow rising behind Fumikage like the living embodiment of darkness only added to the malevolent aura. The second organization was Taboo. First created during the period of time where quirks were becoming more common than not, the foundation had started as an institution for those with quirks that had gone out of control. The general consensus at the time had reportedly been that it would be a place to keep those with sentient quirks that had gone rogue, or had been taken over by their quirks in some fashion, until they'd gotten under control or recovered. The truth was the foundation was a nightmare from day one, living up to its ancient and yet still infamous internet namesake. The SCP was actually worse than a prison for anyone unlucky enough to be sent there. Purportedly, when a woman who managed to escape went public with her experience, her story was disturbing enough to have the facility investigated by the UN itself after only being active for three years. While still in operation, after extensive, and public restructuring, the SCP Foundation was still the boogeyman for anyone with highly mutative or sentient quirks. Just mentioning it in the presence of such individuals had been known to trigger their most primitive and feral survival instincts. Before Fumikage could do any more than stand, Kyauka reached out and placed a gentle hand on his shoulder. The raven had a teen still, but, held his glare. Do you have something to say? The punk rocker asked sharply, animosity for the tail teen just as clear as her avian friends. Ojiro raised his hands in the silent placating surrender. That's what I thought monkey boy. Ojiro's mumbled apologies, sincere or not, were inaudible under the collective sigh of relief from the rest of the watching class 1A. As she sat at her seat, so, felt her masterful control of her emotions slipping more and more. She was so tempted to say something, just the right thing, that would pull her friends over the edge. Unfortunately, her rationality still managed to say its piece and reminded her that beating their bigoted classmate to a pulp would probably earn them all suspensions, if not worse. She silently wondered what the punishment for, Ojiro would be if they told Dezawa sensei that he not only purposefully mentioned a social taboo, but clearly brought it up in regards to how he felt his Izukun should be handled. Potential her shapely ass. Good morning students. And with a simple greeting. Yamiko-sensei diffused the volatile situation with a smile and a wave. Everyone hurried to their seats and prepared for the lesson. There, wouldn't be a reckoning in 1A. For now. An hour later. Walking back to their classroom, Izuku, Hitoshi, and the three zombie girls pondered on what they'd discussed with the shadowy Agent Smith. Her speech had been a clear invitation, there was no doubt about that. But while the experience they'd gain if they took the offer would easily surpass almost anything else offered to them, unspoken, possibilities seemed to hang over them like an armory of poised Damocles daggers. This all centered on one simple surprising detail, one that neither teen had expected, they hadn't been invited to learn under the spooks. They'd been offered a spot amongst the Jaggers. Oi! Midoriya san, is it normal? To still feel the goosebumps even afterwards? Hitoshi asked, attempting to distract himself from, the bubbling feelings of insecurity that threatened to choke him from the inside out. You don't seem phased at all. In fact, neither you or your partners seem bothered by what just happened at all. What the hell man? Well, we're already dead, sleepyhead, Saki quipped, as if it were the most obvious answer in the world that explained everything. Kinda hard to feel fear after dying you know? Death is, a pretty high bar. The blonde's utter lack of vulgarity betrayed how unsettled she actually felt about what had just occurred. Spooks were an official branch of Interpol. Everyone knew they existed, even if they didn't know exactly what they did while doing their jobs. They were shrouded in more mystery than what species the principle of UA actually was. Whether it be the fault of Dodgy, paperwork or conflicting gossip. Their exact capabilities individually and as an agency were little known. 
they were literal figures of myth. The Jaggers? There was hardly a footnotes worth known about them. Izuni, Lily murmured, tugging on her big brother's sleeve, you don't have to go with them, do you? The littlest zombie's worry was evident in her quivering lips and large, watery eyes. And, that footnote, it started and ended with the word, run, written in blood. Garguyu. All present winced at that, Hitoshi more because of the very sound itself than for the reasons why Izuku, Lily, and Saki did. I know, I know, Izuku sighed, a quiet lamentation. But it's that or remain here on campus, stagnating while everyone else gets better and better. Not to mention being here when the rest of the student body is gone increases the chances of being cornered by the media, one way or another. While the hero course held its internships, the rest of UA opened their doors to the public. Historically there'd been tours, a small number of seminars put on by the business course, and almost unfettered media access to the academy's campus. Only rarely were these events cancelled, usually, only when a large number of hero course students failed to secure internships and were thus stuck learning from their normal teachers. And it just so happened that Izuku knew that the rest of 1A, and all of 1B, had already chosen their internships and would be able to leave. Even Tsuchan, Kyauka, and Fumikaj had decided on what offers they wanted to take. Do you guys really understand her? Hitoshi asked, pure curiosity shining through the shiver that tracked his body. Is that somehow actual speech? How can you decipher it? Izuku opened his mouth to answer, just as the secondary door to the classroom of 1A swung open to greet them. How is it that you're still having trouble with this class? Yamiko-sensei's admonishment cut through the air sharp as a paper cut, freezing the group of five before they could fully reach the open door. The difference between, should we book it? Hitoshi asked in a hushed whisper. I don't even know what language they was, but it scares me. It was German, Izuku supplied, already nodding at his friend's suggestion. And I say we book it. Lily thinks some candy from the dispenser down the hall from the support studio sounds really good right now. G Izuku took a step back, readying himself to sprint away from what sounded like a very cross paper sensei, when he bumped into a wall of muscle. Just who I was looking for. Voice booming, Takeogo dropped a massive hand on Izuku and Hitoshi's shoulders, almost causing the teen's knees to buckle. Come with me you two. We must speak about your internship. And what my precious little Miss Owl will, do while you're gone. Call me Lily. The scream came unbidden, Lily hadn't meant to be so loud. Unfortunately, her pappy refusing to call her by her real name was a button that always striped away her self-control. What's going on out here? The collective gazes of those out in the hallway turned towards the door into 1A. Standing in the entryway, bespectacled gaze cocked in false confusion. Yamiko sensei took in the scene before her with a practiced glance. Oh. Midoriya san, Shinso san, you're back. The woman said, smiling freely, and just in time too. The class was just getting to the fun part. Hitoshi shivered. He knew the secret of that grin, it held only wicked intentions. He seen it enough times back home to know. I'm sorry ma'am, but I will be taking Midoriya's and for a little, while, Takeo apologized, frowning at the interruption, we need to come to an agreement about, Takeo broke off as Yamiko sensei silently raised a hand, some unnamed instinct telling the man to immediately silence himself. For her part, Yamiko sensei looked at the large man who'd come to steal one of her students before taking in said student and the littlest zombie beside him. Exhaling slowly, she, realized that substitute teacher she may be, she could still understand the situation perfectly. I understand Go-san, she said, dropping her hand. Midoriya-san, please ask one of your classmates about today's lesson. Remember, even a single day of missed practice can dull even an exceptional talent at languages like yours. Such kind words clashed with the almost whip-like motion Yamiko-senseis. Lowered hand shot out with as it snagged the back of Hitoshi's uniform, the violet having turned to leave with Izuku. You on the other hand Shinso-san, 
will be spending a little extra time with me after class to make up for your earlier absence, Yamiko Sensei said, chillingly gentle. Your language grades aren't bad, per se, but your marks in communication are nothing short of disastrous. We must work on them as soon as possible. With that, the friends were separated by the cruel hands of fate, one dragged into a world of letters and words that tortured his introversive nature, the other doomed to a no doubt painful, in one way or another, conversation with the father of one of his partners. As he was led away, Izuku wondered if this was his karma for being instrumental in all of the recent drama that had befallen the most famous hero academy of Japan. That evening, Aichi Prefecture, Asui Household. After having to spend his afternoon far too close to an oversized, overzealous parent who raved uncontrollably about his precious child not stepping outside of into the dangerous outside world, placating his beloved girlfriend with a heartfelt hug, and devoting an obnoxious amount of brain power to ignore his classmates' looks that ranged from glares to curiosity, Izuku now found himself in the crosshairs of not one, but two worried mothers. Baruchan. Inko whimpered, distressed enough to be wringing her hands already. Is there really nothing you can do about this? Said Frog Woman massaged her aching temples in utter frustration. Rather than explain how his day had been when he'd returned to her home, Izuku had silently presented official-looking documentation to his mother. As her daughter's slight tells that gave her otherwise hidden feelings of worry away didn't change upon the reveal, Baru deduced that he'd already revealed whatever the news was to her. Inko's gasp had caused her to immediately tense. How else would she have expected a mother to react, though, Izuku had been hand-selected to partake in a Jaeger operation of all things. It was incredibly shocking and concerning news to be sure. It didn't even help that the paperwork he'd had been extremely sparse with actual information, what little there was appearing to be half-heartedly assuring there were safety precautions in place for the Verde net. It left much to be desired. The location of the operation was listed as local. For an international organization such as the UN, that could mean anywhere in the country. Worse, Izuku's participation was only outlined as non-combatant and when it came to the UN, that pretty much meant nothing in the heat of the moment. Unfortunately, the gleaming seal on the documents was undeniable. She's dealt with it enough to know, it was all authentic, after years of gaining power and prestige, the Asui matriarch knew she had enough political clout to influence even members of the Diet itself if dire enough circumstances arose. However, in the face of the UN, a voice such as hers hardly mattered more than an ant's. She had no weight in this level of fight. Truth be told, Baru knew she wouldn't even have the clearance to request the information, in the document currently in her hands if it hadn't been provided. I. The frog woman was at a loss for words. For the first time she could remember, she couldn't act to affect an outcome she desired. I can't do. Anything in Cochin. When the UN drafted someone in a member nation for something, the call was a mandatory obligation. Such a rule had been written into the organization's constitution, after it had consolidated the power that came with being a driving force behind stabilizing the world after the Quirk Wars. In the rubble of the pre-Quirk world, it had kept many countries from unraveling in a time of chaos, but to do so those same countries had had to accept the idea of being guided by an outside power that ostensibly held no biased interest that would corrupt its purpose in, protecting them. What really added insult to injury though, was how the desk jockeys of the UN wrote their missives. Reading the document again, Baru scowled at how the wording gave every indication that his Yuka was free to refuse the offer from the Jaggers. In reality, the unspoken truth was very much the opposite. Just looking at the six other options the UN were ready to send is Yuku's way in case, he said no was enough to chill her blood. Two hospitals, Rishi and Central were listed. Two times of the pharmaceutical industry, Parasol and Gentech, were below them. Second to last was the JSDF, a red herring if Baru had ever seen one. And last, and certainly least, came the Wardens of Tartarus. The first four were obviously ploys, the chances any of one them would take the chance to experiment, 
on as Yuku's quirk if he stepped foot on their properties were 100%. Not to be outdone, the last two were openly known for never letting go of any students who interned with them. One way or another. All six options were career killers. What about just staying on campus? Inko asked, trying to find any way for her little boy to avoid unnecessary danger. It might be boring sure, but, it'd be safer than anything else right? Izuku could only let out a sigh, shaking his head. Not an option, Karo, Sa answered for her boyfriend, clearly hating the situation as well. After losing so many sponsors, Aizawa sensei said all available faculty were being directed to up their patrols for the week so UA could start to recover its reputation. Their schedules are so packed none of them would have time to actually teach him. And the only member of the staff that would be left is Recovery Girl. If the prospect of interning with the elderly nurse wasn't bad enough, the fact that doing so would put his Yuku in close proximity to Dr. Go absolutely killed the option. The man made his dislike for his Yuku clear, and no one would accept them being around each other for a longer than necessary. This wouldn't be a problem if the sleepy hobu could do it, Saki spat, snarling. Why the fork isn't he an option again? Isn't he like, one of the only ones in your corner bus? Amgra eh? At Tay's interjection, Saki snapped her fingers, huffing as the answer was thrown in her face. Oh right, blood healed, the blonde groused. Kinda forgot the whole mind control thing the suits fear, so much. Aizawa sensei had been forbidden from taking Izuku under his care beyond the semi-structured instruction of UA homeroom system. That meant among other things, no internship offer. The official reason, which held some weight of being true, was that those in the higher echelons were uneasy about allowing the wielder of a quirk that could control others to be taught by an individual they'd controlled in the past. They had no reliable reassurance that all of cursed blood had been purged from Aizawa Sensei's system or not. For all they knew, and feared, the mysterious quirk had left some minuscule piece of itself behind to nefariously influence the underground hero later on down the line. And he wasn't the only one more closely examined post run-in with cursed blood. Even Tsu was questioned from time to time by psychologists for traces of behavior or beliefs that could be traces of the dark work. The UN wouldn't risk an international incident from this, is Yuku Kun's notoriety is too great at this point, so I do believe they'll keep to the letter of the invitation, Karo, Baru explained, voice heavy. It's his darn luck that I don't trust. The letter had been pretty clear. To be sure. Izuku and Hitoshi would partake in a Loki Yeager mission tilted more toward tracking and interrogation than anything else. There were numerous assurances that any occurrences of combat would be handled by the trained agents on duty, which was also reassuring. Unfortunately, nothing could assure that the mission's targets wouldn't happen to target the two boys. But really, it wasn't, Izuku's health that worried Buru, it was what this would do to his reputation. If people feared him before, after a stint with the Jaggers. Izukun. Tsa called, can you promise to keep a low profile? I can even settle for a simple promise not to do something too outrageous, Karo. Does sticking to my guns count? Izuku asked with an honest smile. Everyone grimaced. I'll take to the melee in the boss stead, Saki offered with a savage grin, that should ease things up, right? Everyone hummed in contemplation. If Buru's suspicions were correct, and she had a career built partially on such feelings of intuition, this operation was going to revolve on the trigger problem. The damned substance had seen a sudden uptick in production and traffic in Japan in the last month, and local police were having a lot of trouble keeping things under control. If that were the case, then as Yuku and the Shinso kid would be tackling either those with weaker quirks, if they went after buyers, or wild cards, if they went after sellers. She'd like to say those with strong quirks would have no reason to deal and trigger, but greed was a cardinal sin for a reason and made people do terrible things for meaningless reasons. If luck held, any potential combat would be limited to small arms fire and improvised melee weapons. In that case, at worst, 
the media would only see a repeat of his Yuku's bullet-eating capabilities. At best, Shinso-san's quirk would steal more attention. She didn't want to think about what would happen if the buyers or sellers the Jaggers were going after already had strong, quirks that were then boosted by Trigger. Baru-chan? Inko's worried voice brought back the frog woman from her inner thoughts. I guess this is better than the alternatives, Karo, Baru replied with a sigh, still, make sure to communicate to us whenever you change locations. Even a single text will do. And never separate from the agents you're assigned to. Let them handle all the dangers. You're, supposed to be there to learn the basics of tracking and interrogation anyway, not fight. I can do that. Is Yuku replied, happy to find some level of support. He almost thought he'd have to pass on this opportunity. I don't like it. Tsum mumbled, still against the idea. What? Don't like that the boss is getting the chance to play with world-renowned pros while you went and picked the sealman? Saki, cracked, suddenly on the offensive, or is it that he's going to play with people who are arguably more dangerous than him for once? Tsum pouted really hard. Normally hiding feelings like jealousy wasn't difficult for her after all. But when it came to Izuku, she felt like she was an open book. Inko, however, whimpered in distress, her baby boy was too keen in getting into dangerous situations. She just knew something was going to happen. Then again, Mr. Go was probably still worse. This isn't fair. Lily lamented in a corner. Lily wants to stay by her big bro's side. Seeing the littlest zombie sob erased all of the previous tension. Giving her reassuring and loving hugs and head pats quickly became the priority of the moment, a welcome distraction. It had been decided that, while not actually a student, Lily would spend the duration of the internship with her father. The request from the man had been sensible enough and everyone had agreed that the littlest zombie shouldn't partake in such an operation if at all possible. Go had been made to swear to not entering any laboratory during said period of time though, his tendency to allow himself to be absorbed by his work, recalled while he'd been making demands. He'd had to choose between his job and his undead daughter and, surprising for some, he had chosen Lily. Izuku kept it to himself but he was dreading returning from his internship to find a lily who had been experimented on. Back in the kitchen, Ganma Asui was on the phone. He massaged his forehead with his free hand, I know you're babysitting a pair of idiots, Caro, the frogman growled slightly, trying to sound casual through his overstressed nerves, but if you could keep track of. Yes. Yes, I know. Not an official assignment. The family men knew very well that he was asking too much. Tailing a group of Jaggers was nothing short of suicidal. Being found doing so? They'd be lucky to find a trace of the body, re really? You will? Ganma stuttered, surprised. He hadn't even had to resort to blackmail, thank you. Yes, of course. You'll have those reservations without delay, Caro. Ending the call. The frogman contemplated just how much more complicated his life had become thanks to the Verdinat that had won his daughter's heart. He supposed it was better than the perpetual boredom of being the director, of accounting at his wife's firm. It almost made him feel like he did back in his younger days, working for Interpol to keep the world safe. Meanwhile, Tokyo Prefecture, Ida Household. Aniki, are you sure of this? Tenya's question asked with genuine sadness tinged with caution, was waved away by his older brother. Before the second son of the Ida family sat Tensai, the firstborn, filling out, paperwork at his work desk. To the younger of the brothers, it was just another reminder that the turbo hero Ingenium wouldn't be returning even if Tensai could once again walk thanks to his darkly inclined classmate. Cursed blood might have been able to heal any wound but a limit had been discovered when Midoriya had used it on his brother. The bio-metal that comprised the physical attribute of, the Ida family's engine quirk was apparently outside the dark quirk's ability to reconstitute. According to the Verdanet, it felt similar to an Amaria where one couldn't feel any sensation. So in the end, while Tensai could walk again, his engines remained damaged beyond repair. Of course Tenya. This is some of the most important parts of hero work, 
Tenzai replied, taking a moment to stop and lock eyes with his little brother. And I need to prepare you to take on the family mantle anyway. While father and I agreed you would one day become an genium, you still have much to learn and understand before then, especially when it comes to leading an agency. Tenya breathed deeply, holding the air inside as a surge of blind rage flared through him. He'd been planning to seek out the hero killer, during his internship. He'd been planning on finding the bastard who'd ended his brother's career and setting a dozen pros on the rabid animal. He'd been planning on getting revenge for their family, even if secondhand due to Midoriya's interference. Alas, his brother had decided for him where he'd be spending his internship week. And he, ever the dutiful brother, had had no choice but to accept his idol's decision. Chained to a desk. His fate was to be locked away, far from any sort of conflict, a prisoner to the eternal enemy of all that was known as paperwork. Even Okako would probably see more action during her internship with Gunhead. The week of internships, Mujurafu Station, Tokyo Prefecture. So it was that on the day the UA internships officially began, the class of 1A found themselves gathered at the city metro station closest to their school. Each of them carried a single bag of luggage and their special cases containing their hero suits. To a one, a feeling of restlessness presided, their excitement of the coming week on the cusp of bursting. They all knew what this week symbolized. It was their unofficial unleashing into the world of heroes. Shouto could already, feel a migraine forming just taking in the sight of his jittery class. Starting today, you'll be interning with real pros. You have your suits. But even so, you are only to use them when instructed to by your mentors, the underground hero said, going over the same script he always did prior to the start of internships. This isn't your hero debut, you're still heroes in training, so remember that, your actions reflect on not only those you're interning with, but as well. Make sure you act like it. As the gruff teacher spoke, a number of his students had already tuned him out. In particular, a certain tailed teen found himself lost in his own thoughts. Finally. We'll be together again. Ojiro cheered within his mind, pleased beyond belief that in no time at all, only a few stations all, told, he would be reuniting with Lady Wu once more. Hazu may not be the safest place, but together we're sure to be invincible. He knew that the hero killer was said to still be stalking the city's streets. With over two dozen casualties to his name, such a villain's presence had made Hazu a hot spot, a juxtaposed mix of fearful citizens and determined pro-heroes. Ojiro also knew that many of those same pros were only there to hunt Stain down for the glory. With the graft had come actually useful heroes, like members of the top 20 who'd promised to join the manhunt efforts soon. For the tail teen, all of it mattered very little. His Lady Wu a mostly unrecognized heroine, hadn't been assigned to hunt down the hero killer, nor did she wish to do so on her own time. Instead, she'd been tasked with preforming her patrols like normal and partake in martial arts showcases around the district. It might not have been the most glamorous work, but it paid the bills and, more importantly, kept her relatively safe. And for once, he'd really be able to help as well. Being a UA hero student, his very presence would surely boost his lady's popularity, even if just a little. It wasn't, every pro that was chosen by the esteemed academy's students after all. Before his mind could wander onto other such enticing thoughts, such as spending extra time with his lady for private training, the tailed teen felt a shiver shoot down his spine to the tip of his tail. Freezing, he slid his gaze to the left, inevitably finding what he'd expected, the pair with the evil quirks. Tsuasui, woefully deluded and indoctrinated, played a dangerous game by pinching the cheeks of her captor, Izuku Midoriya. To the side, the puppeteer Hitoshi Shinso rolled his eyes as he watched the two acting lovey-dovey, no doubt exasperated at how well his brainwashing of the frog girl had gone. His lady Wu had oftentimes reminded him that people with dark quirks weren't necessarily evil, that it was, their actions they were to be judged by. Even so, he couldn't ignore the feeling in his gut. Midoriya's corpse desecrating and mind-controlling quirk was bad enough, but now Shinso, another mind-bender, 
was in 1A as well. Worse, the two had quickly become close friends. Did no one see how dangerous such a thing was? Now go. Aizawa sensei's command snapped the tailed teen from his musings, returning his gaze to his compromised teacher. Ojiro listened to his parting words. And remember, above all else, stay safe out there. As most of his students boarded the trains to their internships, the underground hero watched on in silence. They were acting like children about to receive gifts, far too excited for what should be a serious milestone in their efforts to becoming professional heroes. Only a few carried themselves with any seriousness. He'd have to keep an eye on them all when they returned, see who matured from the experience and who still needed a wake-up call. A part of the gruff man felt a familiar numb emptiness rear its head as he watched them go. His class was incomplete. Rikugo and Mineta aside, their expulsions more than well deserved in his opinion, he'd wanted to give one last lecture to Ida before the boy had left. More likely than not, the idiotic child still carried some foolhardy wish to confront Stain if given half a chance. And then there was Totoraki's absence. He'd been the student in the original class 1A with the most potential. He'd also been the one who'd been in the most need of dire help, the one he'd honestly failed as a teacher. Just that morning, he'd received official word that the dual colored teen would be sent to spend quality time with his mother for the duration of the internships. Pending a psychival, that internship had sounded like it had the potential to be lengthened. And now, for you too. Shouta groused, recomposing himself before turning to examine his remaining students. You're sure you don't want to, drop this? Staying on campus would be much so, no. The perfect synchronicity of the two teens in front of him was slightly off-putting. I'm sorry Aizawa sensei, but I'm not letting Mr. Go experiment on me, is Yuku said shaking his head. An overprotective Tay immediately embraced the Verdana from behind while Saki crossed her arms, stepping in front of her boss with a growl. Shouta silently, thanked whatever heavens watched over their messed up world that they'd unanimously decided to leave Lily behind. And I'm sorry sir, but there's no way I'm staying anywhere near midnight unsupervised, Shinsu deadpanned, paling at the very thought. Hell, even supervised couldn't get me to agree. Satoshi loved her, he really did, but his aunt was way too forward with her teasing when it came to him, than the rest of his family. Just the other day, she'd pushed him and Saranda into a broom closet, locked them in, and then left them there for three hours with only the instruction that the Ravnet teach him to loosen up. But it wasn't like he could just reveal his familial ties to his new sensei, now was it? There was a moment of silence as Shout awaited the words of his new Violet student, finding his fear of his co-worker completely understandable, he nodded once before sighing. Very well then, he replied, let's go. Half an hour later, at a certain cafe, the two UA students, as well as the zombie girls with them, hadn't been expecting to meet agents of the notorious Jeggers in such a casual location. They'd known they wouldn't be setting foot in the UN's embassy, but they'd at least thought that the meeting place would be a police station or something equal in status. Instead, they were quickly led to the second floor of the quaint establishment and to a private room. Before stepping inside, both teens slowed to stop and blinked as the details of the room were made clear on a placard on the door. Soundproofed Hitoshi asked well knowing the signs of such an upgrade without even needing to have it spelled out. Structurally reinforced. Magnetic insulation. Is Yuku added, struck dumb at the level of precautions a simple cafe could have for a simple meeting room. It was almost like the cafe wasn't a normal place. Sheet. Aizawa sensei placed his hand on the doorknob, but didn't move to open the last barrier between his students and what was awaiting them. Seriously. This is your last chance to back out, the underground hero said, tone grave. Nodding their clear understanding, both students still motioned for their teacher to open the door. With a sigh, the pro hero did so, greeting the three with a sight that was anything but what the two youngsters had been expecting. Hello, boys. Agent Smith cheered as the group walked in, her pep sending shivers through the newcomers, both living and undead. Ready to get a taste of playing with the adults? 
at that, from shadows neither teen had noticed until that moment stepped three individuals like living nightmares. The shortest of the three, though still taller than Aizawa sensei, wore a mantle of what appeared to be feathers. If there really was a bird in the world that could make such wicked looking things. Along with the bulk of the coat, the beak like mask the individual wore, and the pointy hat that covered their head, it was impossible for either team to discern if the presumed Jaeger was a man or woman. Not that it really mattered. Next to the shorter member of the Nutrio stood a slightly taller man, face half, covered in dark bandages. To be fair, Izuku only guessed that the second individual was a man due to the masculine facial features he could see, although if said features were correct indicators or not, he couldn't say. Regardless, the agent was clearly old judging by the wrinkles that were visible. The bulky floor-length coat this Jaeger sported was colored a dirty mustard-like hue, while the tricorn hat resting on his head appeared old, battered, and worn. The third and tallest presumed Jaeger was dark. And as Yuku didn't think that in a negative manner, sort of. The man was just dressed in all black, except for the honest to God censor hanging from his neck, from his pitch black trench coat to the undershirt beneath and the tactical pants that led to thick, combat boots of black, leather. His wide brimmed hat was also dyed black. And it did little to cover the man's long, dirty gray hair. In fact, the hat was useless in hiding the man's face at all, clearing revealing the blood-soaked bandages covering his eyes. And the perpetual snarl his face was set in. B boss. Saki stuttered, for once all bravado extinguished. I think. I think that guy killed recently. Like, in the, last twenty minutes. This is as far as I can take you, Aizawa sensei stated. Izuku and Hitoshi only now realizing their teacher had never actually stepped foot in the room. Good luck. And please. Don't die. It was at that moment that Izuku finally realized. He might have, perhaps, possibly, just forked up and made a bad decision. Magnus, due to the amount of complaints about the special chapters, I've decided to set a poll. Now you can decide if you want to keep reading the specials here or leave them behind a paywall on the site that shall not be named. Omake, Tsu's woes. Tsu freshman student of the hero course at UA was known for many things. Her calm and collected demeanor was an attribute recognized by everyone who had met her. Also widely recognized were her smarts and ability to adapt. In all she was referred to as a great example for others follow. If only those same people knew how she felt on the inside. I'm going to kill him. Tsu screamed inside the vastness of her mind as she fast walked through the tunnels of UA Stadium. After the near heart attack she'd suffered when her boyfriend had gotten impaled by an ice spike, she'd had to deal with her mother on the phone while leaving said boyfriend in the infirmary. Even with a gaping hole in his chest, he'd still reassured her he would be fine, that he only needed to lay down and eat something to give his quirk a little fuel. When she'd returned, She'd found Izukun's bed empty, along with a newfound urge to pinch the cheeks of her boyfriend until he begged her for mercy. Why are you like, this Izukun? It hadn't taken a lot of brain power to deduce where Izukun had gone. Even with all the overflowing kindness he had, his heart was still able to contain an impressive amount of resentment. He had confessed to her earlier that should he make it to any of the podiums, he was going to throw a rant during the awards ceremony. That vindictiveness of her boyfriend was no joke. As she, power walked through the tunnels, the screens lining the walls showed her the exact moment her favorite necromancer entered the field of vision of the cameras. She heard the collective gasping sounds, the murmurs and whispers. She witnessed the ridiculous scene of Tei, Saki, and Lily attempting to make Izuku look stronger than he was at the moment. Tei and Lily were outside her authority to deal with both because Tay was truly a monster in strength and stubbornness combined, and Lily was too pure and steadfast to be angry with. But Tsu didn't miss for a second how Saki was doing her best to grab Izuku's butt with each step. Another dose of poison spit to the eyes was in order for the blonde, to be sure. Turning one last corner, the entrance to the arena became visible, just as all, might placed the medal on her boyfriend's neck. 
interrupting now would have still been possible, but would have caused a greater faux pas than Izukun's plan. Being her mother's daughter, she knew such a break in protocol would have led to dear consequences for her. Begrudgingly, Sa gave her boyfriend a victory. She'd just have to make sure he knew he'd be paying for it. B B B B Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z T T T T T. The massive screens populated around the stadium suddenly snapped to static-filled life. The sound of audio snow capturing everyone's attention, whether they wished for it to or not. Less than a handful of seconds later, the chaotic screens flickered and turned dark. Only a large Arabic numeral one at their center. A medal. The lightly synthesized voice that purred from the speakers was glaringly feminine, and equally laden with contempt. This can't be good. Tsa muttered to herself. While the unexpected interruption was many things, to Tsa it was at the moment above highly illegal. She kind of wanted to hear her boyfriend's rant against the system, but this obvious hack into UA network was breaking so many laws it wasn't funny. She wished she could disagree with the words of the hacker's message though. This lady isn't war, Caro. Tsa conceded, failing to suppress the shiver that ran down her spine as she remembered what could have happened to her if she hadn't forfeited against Totoraki. Still, this is definitely crossing into criminal territory. Izukun using his time being awarded to expose the truth to the world might have been more than a little rude, but at least he would have been doing so legally. Why was this hacker risking so much? But perhaps this yearly atrocity shouldn't really be surprising. After all, this is the venerable UA we're talking about here. A world-class hero school that allowed and promoted horrors like this. The screens began to play a familiar scene, one that allowed the frog girl to realize something. This hacker had committed far, larger crimes than just breaking into the UA network to broadcast their message. She suddenly felt sick. She knew what was coming. I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you what a quirk marriage is right? No matter how distorted it sounded by the recording, Totoraki's voice sounded just as hateful and hurt as it had sounded back then. Whatever you think you know, the truth is hundreds. No, thousands of times worse. As the nightmarish recounting of Totoraki's childhood played out, Sa felt the stirrings of guilt in her heart. She would always defend her stance, Totoraki had struck first and so retaliation was justified in her eyes but she and everyone else should have been able to word things a little differently. Listening to their words from an observer's perspective allowed, the frog girl to see just how cruel and selfish both sides' words had been. Maybe if they hadn't been so focused on being right, they might have been able to warn the teachers before the match, before everything had escalated out of control. So deep in her thoughts did so go that she almost missed the moment the recordings cut off. She blinked as her stomach dropped. This hacker was manipulating the whole event. Without the next piece of the conversation, the conflict was without context. This is the deal, boy. You will marry my daughter, and conceive with her at least one female that develops your quirk or an improved variant. Endeavor's voice sent shivers through the spine of the necromancer's girlfriend, both due to its tone and the demand being given. He just said, intimidation, Tsu's broken voice came out a mere whisper. Izukun had told her about Endeavor intruding into his prep room, and he'd admitted that the number two hero had tried to buy him out. But there had been no mention to this. Atrocity. I need. I. Tsu's world was spiraling, this was even worse than even her worst nightmare. Weakly reaching for her phone, Tsu tried to come up with some plan, some idea. Anything that would solve this suddenly revealed situation, but she didn't even know WHO to call, much less what to say. Are you insane? Is Yuku's sharp reply returned Tsu's attention to the nearest screen. The exchange that followed melted away all her worries. In the face of mortal danger and promises of wealth and power, her precious cinnamon roll had chosen her in the most valiant way possible. Her fears of having her boyfriend stolen by the demands, of prettier girls twisted pro-hero father were banished as he spoke of her as the most beautiful maiden in the world. It was fair to say that she fell in love all over again with the emerald necromancer. Fine. I won't kill him, Sa said with a loving sigh, 
her heart slowing back to its normal rhythm even when the screen showed Endeavor starting to heat up. I'm still beating him up though, Caro, Omake, the piece of home. A woman, dressed in a solid black suit that outclassed the darkness of the night, walked toward a rather large house in one of the numerous suburbs of Japan. It was a rather surprising sight, considering that this particular residential zone was considered middle class and the woman appeared to be at least lower high class if not mid high. Of course, said Zone Steering, was almost entirely the fault of said large residence the suited woman was approaching. Many a well meaning cop had called at its store to investigate all sorts of rumors. Loud wailing well into the night, complaints about unruly mutants causing mischief in the streets. There'd even been a report of the house collapsing at one point, only for authorities arriving to find it perfectly fine. It was, chaos half of the time, and misunderstandings every day it seemed, but for one Agent Smith, this was a place she wouldn't trade for the whole world. I'm home. Smith called as she entered the house. Miiru. The shout came from a woman with the lower body of a snake belting her grievance for the world to hear at the top of her lungs. The snake woman, or Lamia as some would think to call her, was pulling the hair of a woman with the lower body of a fish, a mermaid if you would, that was sitting in a wheelchair. I. Told. You. I.T. Wasn't. Your. Turn. Smith looked at the outrageous scene and couldn't help but pinch the bridge of her nose. This was not what she wanted to come home to. Pappy D. I. D. Nothing wrong. An incredibly loud and childish scream was all the warning the smith had before a short woman with wings instead of arms darted through the hallway on the left and sped by her. It was a thoughtless thing to dodge the apparent harpy quirked woman for the trained agent, though the individual who followed after her required a bit more effort to evade. Come back here you little underwear thief. Those won't even fit you. Charging after the harpy came a tall, busty blonde, galloping, at full speed through the house thanks to her equine lower body. The smith had to actually hit the wall to avoid a collision. You okay? The nearly run over woman looked down, shaded gaze meeting that of a small woman whose body was entirely blue. And somewhat transparent. Big solid green eyes stared back at Agent Smith while a singular stalk of green twitched above the shorter woman's head. There, was no malice in the gaze, but for the spook, who spent her days intimidating some of the worst of the worst, it was one of the most unsettling looks in the world. I'm fine suu, thanks for asking, the smith replied, offering no resistance when the shorter woman nodded and wordlessly took her bag from her shoulders. All right you too, you've had more than enough fun today. Snapping back to the scene, that she had first walked in on upon returning home. The smith was greeted by a sight that most people would have found straight out of a nightmare. A pale woman with multiple insectoid-like eyes, and a lower body that was comprised of the entirety of a spider minus the head, had captured the mermaid and Lamia in a net. Both girls were trembling while looking up at the arachne, but the smith wasn't sure if it was in fear of what the older woman had in store for them or something else. Thank you for settling them down Rajne. I appreciate it, said a young man, the first and only male the smith knew she would find in this house. Smiling, the man stood up and dusted himself off, revealing that while not particularly bad looking, he didn't look to be anything special to talk about either. I, was having trouble breathing down there after Marrow's chair ran me over. The smith was instantly reminded of a certain kid she'd just left not too long ago. Oh. You're back already. The man said suddenly, breaking the smith from her thoughts with a heart-melting smile. Welcome home, Kuroko-chan. This was home. Her home. It was a place where broken girls with mutation quirks tended to find, themselves for a variety of reasons. The man of the house, Kamihito Kuruso, accepted any and all that asked asylum, treating them like the people they were, not the monsters the outside world believed them to be. He tended to these girls' mental health, taking all the time necessary to build them back into functioning individuals who could stand on their own once more. And after that, he'd even go, so far as to help his patients find jobs, start new lives. 
Kuroko couldn't count the number of children, young girls, and women that had passed through this house. But she could count the number that hadn't been able to leave. When Caruso had discovered he'd been gifted with a quirk that gave him a terrifyingly deep level of empathy with whoever he directed it to, he'd almost immediately dedicated his life to helping people. He could reach the hearts of the broken, help heal their pain, in his own words, how could he not reach out to them, offer them the safety and support they'd never been given. A rare variety of hero, Caruso had had to fight overwhelming odds, even snatch victory from the jaws of defeat to graduate from UA with a license. Of course, he then immediately retired and, used his large inheritance to build this house and open his practice. He was the only man to date that was able to ignore Kuroko's quirk. He was the only one able to love her under any circumstance. Did you have a hard day at work? Kimihito asked, closing the front door behind her, do you want dinner? Or maybe a bath to relax? It's Mrs. Caruso, the smith replied with a seductive smile, and I'd, rather have you. This man, this true hero, was her Kimahito, her husband. And the husband of the few girls who had never been able to leave. While polygamy was illegal in Japan, her husband's case was special. No one would ever take the other women in the house, no one would ever call them family besides her husband and herself. And when one knew which strings to pull on which governmental puppets, well, Pappy, the one with the harpy quirk, had been taken from a group of thieves. They'd had the genius idea of using her abilities to fly to give their operations a leg up on the competition and authorities. The animals had mauled her and left her for dead in an alley when she'd made one mistake, forgotten one step in a convoluted plan Kuroko had been able to stop before her morning coffee. The a ply named Centria, the woman with the lower body of a horse like a centaur, had been abandoned by the family she'd been sent to when her mother had passed away due to a villain attack. The scum had left her to rot on their farm, chained in the stables as they'd packed up and moved to the city. When Kuroko had found Miya in a laboratory, discovered during one of her more clandestine missions, she'd known the Lamia quirked woman would probably never be leaving her and her husband. Suffering the aftereffects of no doubt countless inhumane experiments, Mia still experienced night terrors and was highly suspicious of most people. Rodnera and Mero were special cases, even for her home. Both women, girls when they'd first arrived, had been the unwilling victims of trigger dosing. Forced, into mutated forms at the hands of unstable strains of the street drug, neither had been welcomed home after the law had rescued them. To this day, the two were still hesitant to even leave the house, afraid of facing the stigma they carried because of how they became mutants. It might have been a very broken family, but it was hers. It was the family she shared a husband with. Well, today is, special, so we were planning on spending tonight all together, Kimihito answered, giving her a quick and chaste kiss on the lips. You still need to eat dinner though. The agent known as Smith, Kiroko Kurasu? couldn't help the smile that spread across her face at the love she could feel being poured into her. The whole world could rail and criticize and denounce her for her status as part of a harem for all eternity, she would never leave this place. It was where a monster like her had found she belonged. S.U.U., could you help me set the table? Kimihito called out, walking towards the massive room that served as their kitchen and dining room. The semi-transparent girl nodded and followed. Leaning against the wall to watch her husband and sister wife at work, Kuroko really tried not to, stare as SUU worked. Unfortunately, the utterly inhuman grace of her sister wife was hard to ignore, almost as much as her otherworldly level of understanding. Without missing a beat, or even looking away from placing the silverware in the correct positions, SUU turned her head to lock eyes with Kuroko. A simple tilt of the head and an unsettling smile were the only response the agent received for, being caught staring. It was almost like the slime girl could read her thoughts. Hey, there really is no place like home, Kiroko said, preparing herself for the no doubt huge dinner about to happen. Tonight was her wedding anniversary after all, she could already tell it was going to be wild. Chapter 43, Sinister Education, Author's Note one that your narrator cannot and will not skip, 
Magnus, I will no longer apologize, and instead explain why there have been these horrible delays. The ketoacidosis that nearly killed me left me scarred, and parts of my brain got affected to the point it's getting painful to concentrate for long periods of time. I'm still going to write this story and all the others, but it will take much longer due to the forced breaks I need to take. Disclaimer, this chapter isn't pretty, it wasn't meant to be. You've been warned. The internship week was a time for UA students to have a taste of the true nature of the profession known as hero, giving them the chance to understand what awaited them after graduation. All hero course students were expected to use the time wisely either to adjust their worldviews on heroes from idealized notions they'd spoon-fed from the media to more grounded expectations, or ultimately, back off if they felt betrayed by the harsh realities of the world or realized they were unsuited for the work at hand. An unintended side effect was that also gave their parents time to themselves. Baruchan, I've been meaning to ask, but... Inko asked, putting down her cup. The rejuvenated mother still frowning at her continued lack of understanding. What exactly are the Jaggers? The Asui matriarch placed her own cup down, taking a deep breath. She racked her brain searching for an appropriate, Inko-friendly, answer to provide. It was harder than it should have been. After years of living in the chaos that was law in a quirked world, and having had to deal with not only her own country's government but those of foreigners who have run afoul of Japan's stricter anti-quirk usage laws, Baru had seen and done quite a lot. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that she was a ground shaker in her field. But even for her, with all her accumulated knowledge and experience, who had even dealt with Interpol and their numerous operations, both public and, off the books, numerous times, she knew she had only an inkling as to what the elusive branch of the UN was really all about. So, she gave what she could give as best she could. If I were to summarize the Jaggers, Caro. Baru started, doubt clear even across her usually expressionless face, I would have to say that they are UN-sanctioned headhunters with the authority to do whatever is necessary to bring down their targets. There was a moment of silence as Inko took in the grim information. Baru knew the description was criminally short, but yet, it still carried a lot of weight. In pre-quirk history, the UN had once supposedly had global authority, but its actual power was almost completely limited in scope of action due to the convoluted laws of its various member countries, and that was, before including its own charter. The organization hadn't had the power to override other countries on any matters, or even to act without votes cast and measures passed. After the Quirk Wars though, where the UN had somehow remained standing firm as a source of stability and order as the rest of the world devolved into madness and had offered assistance to those in need, it was universally accepted that should the need arise, the global institution had the overarching authority to act as needed in order to keep world peace. Few knew that this predomination had been literally written into a new charter that all member countries had been forced to sign when all was said and done. Her short answer brought up another question from the younger-looking mother. I see. Inko said hesitantly, still full of questions. What she really wanted clarification on was a certain agent that he had been monitoring her son since glowing baby knew when. And what about? Spooks. It might have been hushed, almost whispered. But the word alone still caused Baru to wince. The Asui matriarch hated the spooks, honestly, especially since they had entered her office numerous times, whenever they willed, and, rifled through her files. Usually when she wasn't physically there. She always knew when a spook had paid her firm a visit though, even if none of her staff could or would confirm her suspicious, because there were always minuscule tells she could find without fail. Namely, and most often, was that her coffee machine would always have one or two less servings in its container than when she'd last, left it. That being said, most of her actual interactions with the spooks, brief as they'd been, had been through the one that went by Agent Sato. To that very day it still baffled her how the mountainous Austrian could move so stealthily. And say so few words. I guess the short of it is, Caro. Baru struggled to condense her knowledge into few words, they are UN agents with the authority to do, whatever is necessary to assure their mission is completed. 
Inka looked at her friend with nothing but anxious confusion in her eyes. Baru grimaced at the helpless look. She knew that her lack of available knowledge wasn't the most helpful, but unfortunately what little she did know made her perhaps one of the scarce few that had any level of knowledge about said topics. Meanwhile, what is she, Nagano Prefecture, shrouded in the darkness of a nameless back alley, a rather short young man kept watch over the back entrance of an otherwise normal-looking establishment. The man was dressed in a somewhat fancy-looking olive long coat, under which a series of belts secured bags and pouches across his torso. Each of his forearms were protected by gloves, and his legs by boots, reinforced by braces. The brass-like alloy of the metal works contrasting in eerily fashion against the otherwise black and leather of the outfit. Rather than wearing a hat, or any other type of headgear, the man made use of a dyed cloth that covered his mouth and nose. At first glance, most civilians dismissed the fancily suited man to be a pro-hero's sidekick, perhaps one specializing in diplomacy, that had, some unfortunate facial mutation due to his quirk they all would be dead wrong. The young man was not a sidekick, or even an unknown newbie hero, but still a high school student. And the people he was working with at that very moment were no pro heroes. Izuku Midoriya, code name, Bloodborne, was learning. From Jaggers. Front secured, Shinso, code name Gardener, said as a whisper through the, secured channel the comm beat Izuku had in his ear was linked to. Everything appears as the informant said. Izuku was learning, in this instance, that sometimes the darkness of the world use the most innocent of facades to do its business behind, but more so that more evildoers than you could ever imagine had a talent for masquerading as common bystanders. It was almost like an addendum to the lesson All Might had once taught then during the first week of school when they'd had the battle trials, just more in depth and with obvious real world application. I don't like this. Bloodborne muttered into the air, still linked to the whole team through his comm bead, it reeks of ambush. He was also learning that the sensibilities of a limelight pro hero, and that of a more grounded hero, were, different, mirroring the type of paths they walked. Where pros patrolled in the light before everyone's eyes, Izuka was moving through the oft ignored and festering shadows. Are you getting cold feet? Came an elderly voice in reply. The old man didn't sound disappointed, but there was something behind his tone. It was as if he were judging. Everything. The elder Jaeger had been introduced by the code name of Golden Fox, and he was the official tracker of the team. While he hadn't yet revealed his quirk, he had proven to be absurdly good at picking up individual scents and reading emotions. He had detected their first target by the faded scent of disinfectant alone, Piecing together the rag they'd found four blocks over had recently been used to clean trigger from some other item. Then, he'd instantly picked up the fact that the proprietors of the business they were now stalking out had lied to them when they'd canvassed the area. Don't listen to that paranoid old coot, he's worse than a baby chick when it comes to being cautious, an elderly woman spoke up, earning what sounded like a muffled complaint from the old man in question. We are ready for your signal, Bloodborne. The grandmotherly woman had given her code name as Silver Crow when Izuku and Shinso had met her. Old as she was, she still moved with an almost unnatural grace. Her quirk hadn't been discussed, but Izuku was beyond confused as to what it could be. So far he'd been witness to her walking without making a sound, running along walls as if they were the floor, jumping to heights pre-quirk humans, would have called inhuman, and striking with the precision of a career assassin. He and Shinso had quickly agreed that if she were so skilled and dangerous now, they never wanted to discover how scary she'd been before time had whittled away at her. But as for this moment in time, the crow appeared to be content to let her team's interns handle the scouting, which is why Izuku and Shinso found themselves in some dark back alley now. Apparently, this particular location was where a certain designer drug popular in certain circles was being sold to only the most trusted of clients. It was reportedly being sold for outrageously cheap prices for being both a relatively rare drug as well as highly illegal, which was suspicious in and of itself. The precautions they discovered the dealers, had been taken to avoid being tracked by any third parties had deepened their concerns. 
Luckily for them, they'd been able to round up a few recorded addicts and, with a quick application of Gardner's brainwash, we're pointed in the right direction. Such directions were why they were now surrounding a nefariously plain-looking donut shop. Again, Izuku wondered at how the locale appeared, completely and utterly unremarkable. The brick-and-mortar shop blended in perfectly with the surrounding buildings on the block, drawing no attention to itself with flashy signage or paint jobs. Its presence fit what one would expect to see in an area at the edge of a commercial district, down to the slightly weathered façade and half-boarded-up windows. It was entirely normal. Normal enough, ironically, to have both the pair of heroes in training and their Jaeger instructors on edge. The entire task force had felt the normality of the building pin their paranoia senses. It was all too ordinary, too perfect in its urban decay camouflage. In a world where normalcy meant there really was no normal, where even the most humble of businesses were forced to fortify themselves against all sorts of localized disasters, finding a donut shop that looked like time had frozen it in a time of peace could only mean that something was wrong. It had only taken a couple of minutes to notice the discrepancies. There was a noticeable lack of clientele. A cursory glance around the premises had brought into question the shop's apparent lack of a route for resupplying itself with periodic shipments. The menu, visible from outside, boasted perfectly reasonable prices, but with neither customers nor inflow of goods, there couldn't be a return flow of profits which meant that a business like the one they'd been observing should have sunk long ago. Izuku's assessment, given within five minutes of arriving at the locale, had been well received by the Jaggers. The trio had nodded approvingly without missing a beat, already, coming to much of the same conclusion. Shinso had been surprised by the Verdanet's deep analysis, but managed to keep a firm semblance of being too tired to care. Surprisingly enough, after the analysis, it had taken ten minutes to convince the Jaegers to not just assault the place. The third Jaeger, the one dressed mostly in black and going by the code name of Iron Bear, had been visibly, frustrated with Bloodborne and Gardner's pleas. To date, neither teen had heard an actual word from the man, at most an odd, lowly guttural growl or two, but even still they'd felt he was borderline feral. Earlier, when the crow had slashed the legs of a fleeing informant, the bear had immediately gotten a hold of the addict's neck and lifted him up into the air, single-handedly. The sight had, boggled as Yuku and Shinzo's minds due to the fact that while the older man looked strong, neck-lifting an obese man with an unfortunate pig mutation quirk should have been nearly impossible, even with a strength-enhancing quirk. The physics of the act were just that hard to overcome. Ultimately it had been the crow who had been the one to convince the bear to allow Shinzo to work his magic. Whatever, she'd done, and neither Izuku nor Shinzo had caught what it was, had just barely reigned in the aggressive Jaeger. That restraint hadn't carried over unfortunately. As soon as they decided that the donut shop would need infiltration Ghoul had had to physically stop the man from just walking in with his axe unsheathed. To Izuku and Shinzo's surprise, the Ravnet had struggled to do so, throwing out a hastily made plan had been the only way as Yuku had been able to convince the Jaggers that waiting a measly ten more minutes would allow them to complete the mission more easily, stopping a potential massacre or someone on the team from getting injured hadn't seemed to cross any of the three adults' minds. And it had been a rather simple plan, really. Scouting out the back alley. Behind the shop had revealed a suspicious set of vents that were far too industrial for an establishment that purportedly sold donuts. On top of that is Yuku had discovered what appeared to be a storm door into the building's basement that had been upgraded from a standard commercial brand metal hatch to a thick, military-grade version. This in itself wouldn't have been suspicious. On a, government-operated installation. For a donut shop, however, such choices were seriously overkill, and against civil regulations. Recent laws reacting to quirked violence might have allowed such renovation on a personal dwelling, but here it had set already twitchy alarm bells ringing. Having been on a short timer, Izuku had sent Traith to infiltrate through the vents, a task she'd set to with, gusto. However, not even Izuku had understood why she'd worded the action as solid sneaking. Thud. 
Now, after waiting on the edge of his nerves, the hardly noticeable sound of combat boots landing on some men signaled to Izuku that the blonde undead had returned. Done boss, Wraith announced with a self-satisfied grin, even as she managed to maintain a degree of more or less seriousness. It's, almost exactly as you said. The grinning blonde paused, intentionally dragging out the rest of her report. Izuku, nerves fraying, moved with a very worried frown to ask for more details when Wraith finally decided to continue. Only two basements and a secret exit, the Wraith reported with a thumbs up, not the four basements and three secret exits set up you were worried about. Izuku took a deep, breath, mentally repeating to himself that he wouldn't change Saki's mischievous attitude for anything in the world. Her freedom to be a pain in his ass was evidence of her lasting humanity, and he was thankful for it, and her irritating behavior here wasn't hindering the operation at all. Good, Bloodborne replied, handing over a couple of breaching charges and flashbang grenades to his trusty, if happily delinquent, companion. Guide the Iron Bear to where you think the secret exit's entrance out here is and get ready. Seeing Sack, Wraith go stiff at the prospect of walking around with the murderous agent didn't give Izuku an ounce of vindictive glee, definitively nothing like that, no sir. He especially felt nothing when he noticed that the blonde had been forced to jog it a comically, fast pace when the Iron Bear had quickly gained on her due to his size. His ominous axe already in hand. He did feel an overwhelming sense of anxiety though. Taking a moment to go over what he had on hand, Izuku turned his focus to the tools he'd brought with him. In his right hand he carried the combat tool that Mai had made exclusively for his use, the walking cane forged from a tungsten steel, alloy. Its handle, made of an insulating polymer, was the only indication of the weapon's hidden mechanism that the largely non-threatening walking stick was capable of extending into a chain whip with dynamos placed at regular intervals. Hatsume had called her baby the threaded cane, why as Yuku could only guess, but after being shown its capacity to build up a moderately dangerous electrical, charge after enough consecutive swings in its chain whip form, he could honestly care less. The cane had been perfect, it wasn't lethal, not even incapacitating but its jolts would surely help him in disarming weaker opponents and hopefully catch stronger adversaries off guard. In his Yuku's left hand, he held a modified version of his prototype gun, its beta design, so to speak. It was now double, barreled, almost more cannon than pistol, and capable of handling both foam bullets and stun shells. A tiny lever next to where his thumb would rest served not only as a safety, but also as the means to choose from single to double shot. It honestly looked a little outlandish, and Hatsume had demonstrated to him the addition of a special mechanism that made it even louder than a regular pistol, to boot. It was everything that his Yuku could have asked for, utility and intimidation rolled into one. In position. Charges ready, Wraith announced through the comm beat. Ready for countdown. His Yuku took one more deep breath stealing himself for what was about to happen. On my mark, Bloodborne commanded with total, non-existent, confidence. Even just standing there he could feel his stomach turning, eat self into knots. Why had he been chosen as leader of the operation? Was it punishment for speaking out against the Jaggera's shared bloodlust? 3. 2. 1. Breach. The moment the order was given. Izuku felt Tei's hand fall onto his shoulder. It was like the undead girl really wanted to prevent him from joining in the soon-to-be carnage. It was also wholly unnecessary. Boom. Crash. Bam bia bam bam. The muffled ignition of a breaching charge was quickly followed by the sounds of violence. As had been agreed, neither Izuku nor Shinso were actually meant to partake in any violence if it could be avoided. They were instead positioned at the public entrance and exit of the donut shop so they could block any potential runners from escaping. Even Wraith, undead though she was, had been ordered earlier on to merely guard the secret exit as the Iron Bear did his job. On guard and growing greener in the face by the moment, neither hero in training believed for a second that they would ever be able to unhear the fleshy impact sounds, accompanied by horrifying screams, that soon came from within the shop. Izuku Midoriya, 
hero in training and staunch proponent of being a force, for good, was learning. That day, he learned more than most in the hero business would ever learn. Whereas spooks were all about stealth and secrecy, of precision and efficiency, and finishing their missions with the least amount of overt drama possible, the Jaggers could be seen as their exact opposites. Crash. One of the front windows of the donut shop shattered, the body of a person flying, through it and slamming hard against a street lamppost. There was a distinct crunching sound as the body struck the metal pole, followed by a more disturbing lack of further movement once said body slid down to hit the ground. If spooks were scalpels, then Jaggers were definitely wrecking balls covered in demolition charges, roughly five minutes later. When the two heroes in training were given the OK to enter the shop by Silver Crow, they immediately wished they hadn't. Your predictions and strategy were almost spot on, Bloodborne, the Crow announced, praising the green-haired Tina as she looked to both students. Besides her head, not a single part of the older woman moved from her spot guarding the door to the shop's back room. There was actually less resistance than what you had predicted since the guards were slightly less prepared, but I will take that as a good thing. A good thing? The shop was a mess. Such praise felt like mockery in the face of the bloody massacre that seemed to have occurred during the operation. In the storefront alone as Yuku and Shinso could see five bodies. Based on the dress of the corpses, it appeared there had been three workers and two clients that had been spread across the room. As in, literally spread about in several pieces. Hey boss. Wraith called, fake cheer heavily weighing in her voice as she entered the storefront. Good thing you didn't try to enter from the secret exit. Sheet went down over there. On an unrelated note, don't fork with a bear. While Saki, being serious about anything, much less giving a warning was disturbing in and of itself, is Yuku catching a subtle nod from the crow made his feeling of dread grow even worse. The rebellious undead was no stranger to violence, having lived and died by it, but it seemed like even she had a limit to what she found tolerable. Trying to distract himself from the pit that had replaced his stomach, is Yuku, cast his thoughts out to what he could use to distract himself. You doing alright, gardener? Bloodborne finally decided to ask. Catching sight of the violet, he was glad he'd done so, Shinzo looked positively ill. No. Came the voice of the brainwasher, slightly synthesized due to the only equipment he'd been able to procure that wasn't the most basic tactical gear you a clearly biased public, contractors would give someone with a villain's quirk. His voice modulating mouth guard. Not everyone can get over this as easily as you do Bloodborne. Unknown to most, Hitoshi Shinso was no stranger to gruesome sights. Having grown up in and then become an enforcer for the garden had meant that he'd had to deal with seriously messed up people from time to time, and the consequences of their actions. That had included seeing corpses, and worse. Most of the time it had been him cleaning up a mess caused by one of his more violent aunties, those whose pasts came back to haunt them and were reacted to accordingly. Far more scarcely, but infinitely more traumatizing, were the occasions he'd had to step in and save one of his dear sisters from some twisted villain, or corrupt hero, before, the freak succeeded in expanding their gruesome trophy collection. In all the time he'd spent under Aunt Harrible as one of Mama Yu's enforcers, only once had he failed to reach one of his sisters in time. The memory of that failure was what fueled his need to become a strong, reliable hero. Why do you think that? Bloodborne all but snapped out, pulling Shinzo from his thoughts. The Verdnet's exasperation was quite clear. Why does everyone think that? Staring his internship partner dead in the eye, Shinzo pointed behind the necromancer without looking away. Just looking at Ghoul, the guy's first partner, should have been reason enough, right? For his part, is Yuku grit his teeth, but said nothing. He supposed it made sense to the outside observer. He'd been exposed to death far earlier than, most people ever would be, and had admittedly overcome it on several occasions. With only those instances as evidence, it would be natural for outsiders to believe he was inured to death, even if that was far from the truth. He has a point, boss. Wraith conceded, not helping at all. G Ghoul rebuked, 
lolling her head to the side and glaring duller at the blonde. Is Yuku Midoriya might not have been a stranger to death, but the truth was far simpler than he become immune to its effects. Rather than being unfazed, it was his ability to keep a stony face in all situations that never betrayed his true emotions. In truth, is Yuku's heart ached, he truly felt for those whose lives had ended too soon, both in regards to the innocent who deserved to live longer, fuller lives, and the villain, who still needed to pay for their crimes in full. So you still feel something? Even for these animals? The fox asked, his question breaking the teens from their discussion, the two remembering that they were in the middle of a very real, very important international mission and not a school simulation. Are you going to defend them now too? Both as Yuku and Shinso flinched, whether from the Jaegers, harsh tone or the blood-soaked, serrated blade in his hands. It was honestly up for debate. No. Bloodborne replied weakly, though he balled his fists as he steeled himself. Defiantly, he raised his eyes to meet those of the scarred agent. But I would rather capture them alive than this, this slaughter. These people deserved to face justice. How do we know any one of them might not have been here, against their will? How does skipping judge and jury and jumping straight to executioner make anything be, rather than being interrupted by a rebuttal, as he'd expected, it was the deafening silence and judgmental stare that stopped his Yuku cold. Swallowing whatever he'd been about to say, Gold and Fox turned to look at Silver Crow. The elder lady only gave a silent shake of her head. The man huffed before turning to walk into the other room. Is Yuku Midoriya gulped, understanding only then that he had failed something, although he had no idea exactly what. In contrast Shinso merely frowned, saying nothing but growing worried all the same. Both of them had been chosen for this, handpicked by a spook no less and accepted by the powers that be inside the UN, but now he felt like they didn't, understand what was really going on. Come, the Kuro bid her grandmotherly tone utterly failing to instill any level of comfort in the two boys, it's time for you both to do your parts in all this. Their parts. Interrogation. Following the crow, the trio entered the adjacent room that the fox had retreated through, Bloodborne and Gardener immediately noticing another three mutilated corpses. This, time it was two men and one woman, at least two of them mutants and all three big enough to intimidate lesser people. They were strewn about like torn apart rag dolls, and all had blades in their hands, still attached or not. It was getting harder for both youths to see these people as having been present against their will. Moving down the back room's hidden stairs into a first and then second, basement, both heroes in training were thankful the underground floors were clean for their innocent eyes. The first basement held only storage boxes and grates. The second though was full of laboratory equipment, and stacks of boxes marked for distro lined the walls. A single upturned box had its contents spilled out onto the floor, and no one could deny the sight of the glass vials filled, with toxic green liquid within. This was a trigger production center all right, albeit a smaller one by the looks of it. Both teams had to fight a knee-jerk reaction to rear back from the highly illegal substance. Here are our targets. Your targets. The fox announced as they finally reached a much small room with only a table and a couple of chairs inside. A man in a lab coat had already been forced into one chair while another two men and two women were tied up and kneeling in a corner. All five captives appeared to be dressed as scientists, or perhaps medical staff. Do your part. Both teens nodded. There was nothing to say. This is what they were here for. Normally. This would be the part where we teach you how our interrogations are performed, all the ins and outs of the trade so to speak, the crow said, her light tone not at all matching the subject matter being discussed. The elderly Jaeger tilted her head while looking at the two students. Smith though. She insisted on us letting you do things your own way this time. So, out of respect for her professional opinion, go ahead. Realizing now just how much the spook had been involved, Bloodborne and Gardener both nodded in, understanding. You're up man, Gardener whispered to his classmate, barely shaking his head. Brainwashing is good at physical manipulations, not this kind of thing. 
I can make him dance, not sing. Filing that bit of information away for later, Bloodborne sighed, but stepped forward all the same. Moving to sit in front of the target, the white coat simply scoffed in response. The self-proclaimed, man of science knew his rights, he'd been in situations like this before. He also knew exactly how things would play out, if he played his hand correctly. He'd never seen or heard of any of these heroes before, and one thing you could always count on in this world were no namers being willing to bend the rules to get a chance at a bigger score to up their fame. This is completely unnecessary my, friends, the man said calmly, there is no need to play the good and bad cop routine. None of us need to waste our time when I'm perfectly willing to cooperate. Just call up an advocate and we can get started. In the past the man had relied on various human rights committees that ensured the well-being of non-heroes in criminal situations for developments such as this. There was always a bleeding, heart willing to take a case like his if it meant keeping heroes from possibly abusing their powers. As soon as you get me a lawyer and a deal, with the respective assurances of protection, you'll get all the information you want from me. Bloodborne paused for a second, blinking at the sheer audacity of their captive. Didn't this guy understand the deep sheet he was in right now? Did he truly believe he could hide behind the law after everything he'd been involved with? Had he done so before? What kind of person would help a criminal like this escape justice? I'm sorry if this bursts your bubble or gets in the way of your training kid, the man apologized with a mocking smile, obviously taking pleasure in calling out what he realized was a rookie. I don't know what overly dramatic operation improbable sheet they fill your heads with back at your schools, but most of us back Ollie docs are actually quite reasonable, and intelligent. There's no need for you to put on a play and pretend to break the law. We're not going to resist once you've made the arrest. The sooner we get on with the legalities. Bloodborne thought he finally understood. I'm afraid you're making a mistake here, sir. Gardner spoke up for his partner just as Ghoul and Wraith took up positions behind the white coat. We're not heroes, and this isn't an arrest. The white coat looked confused at such a declaration. The gears in his head turned so hard at the new information one could see them strain in his eyes. Possibilities came and went as his neurons fired at rapid speed. Was this a hostile, takeover from a rival faction? Was he going to be hired by a rising power? This is a Jaeger hunt. Bloodborne's declaration froze the room, the hero in training all too pleased to finally get an expected reaction from the trigger dealers. It was surprisingly amusing to see the very human reactions of their captives. The restrained men and women in the corner squirmed like worms in a storm, each, trying to make themselves appear even smaller than they already were. The white coat sitting at the table was the most reactive, he immediately did his best to try to bolt. In fact, by the look on his face he fully intended on scurrying all the way to Africa that very minute. Wham! Instead he found his forehead slamming the table. Where the fork do you think you're going, asshole? Wraith literally, growled, her eyes blazing with absolute delight. She twisted the white coat's arm harshly, clearly intent on breaking it. The fun part's just about to start. Ah! Please! Stop! The man screamed for all he was worth, completely unused to being manhandled, and absolutely terrified of being in the hands of international agents rather than local authorities. I will talk. Of course you'll talk. Bloodborne agreed smoothly, reaching for a large syringe that Ghoul extended to him. You'll be answering all of our questions, and will believe every word you say. For a split second, Gardener though he saw a hint of approbation from the fox, the flicker of emotion disappeared the moment Bloodborne worked his magic. It only took a single syringe of blood, and one minute for that to settle, and, then there was no more struggling from the white coat. The man's eyes became a glowing, bright red from one blink to the next, and his tongue became loose immediately after. The interrogation that followed barely lasted ten minutes. They were the worst ten minutes of Izuku and Shinzo's lives. Not because the questioning was violent, but because of how much information cursed blood made a white coat reveal. Izuku Midoriya, code name, Bloodborne, and Hitoshi Shinso, 
code name, gardener, were learning. They were learning that the darkness of their world that crept in from the shadows was vast and deep, and that to ensure the peace their loved ones deserved, there would come times they'd need to get their hands dirty. Thankfully, the day was not one of those times. Hazu? Gardener asked, no, small amount of trepidation heightening his modulated voice. That was one of the only places they weren't supposed to touch during this mission, why Hazu? It wasn't the possibility of facing off against the hero killer that worried the Violet. Such an encounter would be paltry. Considering his present company, all things considered, he didn't think that Stain could possibly pose much of a threat against a single Jaeger, let alone three. It was the mess the Limelight heroes would make when, not if, they crossed paths. Jaegers didn't follow the official hero standard set by the HPSC. After all, and anyone involved with them immediately went on the commission sheet list. I don't know, the white coat answered truthfully, unable to say anything else while his soul was the grip of the necromancer's quirk. But all signs point towards the big boss wanting to perform a test of the refined product there for some reason. He's already ordered the source to be sent there for the very same reason. It's been weaponized then? The fox asked suddenly quickly being seconded by a guttural growl from the bear. The big man looked far past ready to tear the white coat apart with his, bare hands after hearing him spill his guts for the last ten minutes. I don't know. The disgraced scientist shook his head, portraying a calm that he most definitely didn't actually feel, if he could feel anything at all at the moment. It's always just been a lucrative drug to me and my crew. We never thought to weaponize it. While neither he nor Gardner had been fully briefed on the details of their mission, kept on a need to know only, Bloodborne had been able to piece together a fraction of the greater picture since they'd started from overheard conversations and his inherent heightened intelligence. At this point, he believed he puzzled out what the actual job of Interpol's spooks and jeggers were, and why the weaponization of a new drug had his instructors so reactive. You see, as everyone knew, Quirks changed the world in many ways when they'd mysteriously appeared. In many cases, those changes were for the worse. Before the age of quirks, terrorism had been a known quantity of great evil, a cancer to the global society as a whole. Religious fanatics, unfathomably greedy politicians, the affluent who were apathetic to the struggles of those with less fortune than themselves, whatever the precipitating details, certain people jeopardized the peace of the world on a regular basis. They would either try to start new armed conflicts, or continue to worsen already unfolding conflicts occurring by spreading death and misery through ballistic bombardment, crooked treaties and deals, bioweapons, and worse. The only saving grace of that era was that those, terrorists, conventional and otherwise, were relatively few in number. In the new age, in their quirked world, no one could afford to risk terrorism at any scale. With 80% of the global population born with some sort of superhuman power, the risk of an individual being quirked with an ability that had the potential to be wielded as a bioweapon or other sort of weapon of mass destruction, was a daily concern. Human rights, however, demanded that everyone be given the benefit of the doubt, and even then humane treatment whenever found guilty of such crimes. Advocates for such rights also tended to forget the rights of the victims who suffered under power-mad lunatics. Thus, once the first signs of global stability were realized, the UN had used its new authority to set the rules of the quirked world with an iron hand. Terrorism, in any form, would not be tolerated. At all. Convicted terrorists would be punished, without question, in accordance with their threat level. Any countries found to be infected with nascent or realized terrorists would be subjected to a swift but total blockade and economic embargo until they solved their problem themselves. If a country was found to be unable to comply under its own power, the sovereignty of said country would be withheld and its administration would be temporarily placed under BSA jurisdiction until the issue was solved. You created a new brand of trigger that comes with the side effect of warping emitter and transformation quirks into mutant ones, Bloodborne snapped, steadily growing louder with each word. He couldn't, believe the idiocy of this self-proclaimed scientist. 
and you never considered it could be used as a weapon. Do you even realize what could happen to Japan if French elements got a hold of such a resource? Historically, countries placed under blockade and embargo inevitably suffered from the exclusion, as did their citizens. Almost no one in contemporary society believed it was a good thing to be cut off from the world. Even less people wanted the BSA knocking on their door. While the Marshall branch of the UN put forth nothing less than a heroic effort to prevent global disasters, they were also well known for their overzealousness. Case and point, a decade ago they had been deployed to pacify a cabal of villains in the People's Democratic Commune of Tanzan, a country that had risen from the ashes of the Quirk Wars in Africa. The villains had gotten their hands on some sort of super virus and, when reports from the country's government had abruptly cut off, the BSA had been mobilized. Tanzan had been raised, and was still in shambles even now. Such utter destruction was difficult to criticize, as the alternative would have seen a quarter of the global population dead and half of, what remained nothing but shambling corpses. From all of that and what he'd previously deduced, Izuku had come to realize that spooks and jaggers were preemptive tools used by the UN before the BSA was called upon. If his hypothesis was correct, a spook's job was to locate and analyze possible global-sized threats and, if possible, remove them quietly. Such a role certainly explained why they had, so much authority, most countries would most likely rather allow the shadowy agents to do as they please and brush a few bodies under the proverbial rug than have to deal with jaggers or, glowing baby forbid, the bsa. My intention was to design a type of trigger that was easy to produce while inherently addictive and therefore profitable, the white coat repeated himself, sounding weak, even under cursed blood's control, it seemed he was realizing how deep in the sheet he was. I was never in this to design a weapon. That is not any better, the fox replied, reaching for his serrated blade. His emotionless face was visibly straining to remain so. And neither does it serve as a defense. Speaking of the Jaggers, Izuku could see now that they were the agents deployed when things had escalated too far for a spook to handle, but not too out of proportion that the Bsa's response wouldn't be overkill. Suffering collateral damages such as a few buildings being demolished and a number of vehicles being totaled, on top of needing to cover up probably dozens of bodies, was still a much better option than having a country invaded by a rather over-enthusiastically aggressive army. You said that the source was being sent to Hazu, Bloodborne said abruptly, surely interrupting an impending murder. Seeing the fox and the bear so close to killing had sent his mind scrambling to find a reason to keep the prisoners alive so they could be properly judged instead of flat out murdered. Where is your crew's component? For the first time since meeting their instructors, both Izuku and Shinzo could have sworn that they saw a surprise flash across the features of the three Jaggers. Even through their facial accessories. Unfortunately, the reaction of the white coat instantly dulled the surprise and satisfaction of thinking of something the professional agents hadn't thought to ask. The so-called scientist, who until then had been passively sitting under the effects of cursed blood, now looked an ugly mix of horrified and disgusted. And rebellious. The white coat nearly strangled himself, his jaw flexing to the point his teeth might have cracked as he suddenly gave every bit of his willpower to resist speaking further. Ultimately though, it was a pointless endeavor. It's a. It's a. A. Mons. Stir. In another world, in many alternate timelines, Izuku Midoriya might have failed to understand the true meaning behind such words. As the hero in training Bloodborne, however, who had lived the life of this as Yuku Midoriya. Where? The word was not said with the voice of Bloodborne as the Jaggers and Gardener had been expecting. That single word was spoken with the weight of something far from human. Is Yuku couldn't have cared less. For the everyday person, the word monster was, once associated with anything non-human, whether that be an appearance or action. In the age of quirks, that definition had been forced to change to mostly indicate mutated animals, as the idea of a normal person was no longer easy to describe, or the worst of the worst villains. However, for those unfortunate souls like Bloodborne and Gardener, that word took on a much darker meaning, one laden, with prejudice, 
bigotry, and pain. There there is a hidden cham chamber behind the second shelf in the next room, th that's where we keep it. The white coat was sweating bullets, his teeth chattering as he tried fruitlessly to fight against Bloodborne's control. His eyes watered as he realized what was going to happen, and the fate he would face after the truth was revealed. As he'd been, speaking, the other detained members of his crew had begged for him to stop, for him to think of what he was doing. It was only once they realized he couldn't that they turned to begging for mercy instead. Marching over to the now revealed secret room took barely a minute, but overcoming what they would discover inside would take Izuku and Shinso years. Hitoshi Shinso, code name, Gardener, was, well acquainted with the darker aspects of the world. For as long as he could remember, he and his family had always dealt with, and fought against, the dirtier shadows of society that the great limelight heroes never seemed to bother shedding light on. All told, as far as he could calculate, Shinso and his family had managed to rescue more lost and broken souls from the depths of darkness and, despair than many pros could boast throughout their entire careers. Only All Might and the next seven pro heroes after him in Japan had comparable records. As the saying goes, the brighter the light, the darker the shadow, and in the wake of the overwhelming beacon that was All Might, the shadows did become smaller, but those that remained grew exponentially darker. Mo Mother Mercy. Gardner, choked out. His voice strangled as he and his classmate laid eyes upon the illicit lab's component. Disclaimer from your narrator. If you are easily offended or whatever synonym of that, brave yourself for either skip or quit. You have been warned. The chamber was revealed to be set up in such a way that it resembled a hospital room, but one from a nightmarish mirror world. Chained upon the singular bed in the room lay a heavily mutated, and naked, woman, though it was impossible to tell if her state of being was the result of trigger or if how she appeared was her natural form. Immediately noticeable due to her nakedness was the woman's pale bluish skin, which stood out against patches of bright green scales. The woman's serpentine tail, instead of legs, also stood out as it was long, enough it trailed over the edge of the bed and coiled half-heartedly upon the ground. With her arms chained to the wall as they were, the badly cut feathers that grew from their underside were clear to see as well, along with the mint green tentacles that fell from her head instead of hair. If she'd been healthier, both heroes in training separately admitted to themselves that the woman would have, been a gorgeous sight to see. But. She was far from healthy. The unknown woman kept prisoner by the lab was covered in scars, lacerations, and tubes. Even her naked frame, which might have evoked some sort of hormonal or psychological response from the two teenagers, couldn't rouse anything but heart-aching levels of horror and pity. And then Bloodborne and Gardener could no longer look at the victim they had just found, and turned their gazes to the rest of the room. Immediately, they wished they hadn't. Worse than even the state of the woman was what lined the table next to her. Glass jars. Test tubes. Beakers. These and more each contained a menagerie of grotesque horrors. The beakers empty at that moment, but the dried residue that could be seen even from a distance was enough to turn stomachs. The test tubes were nearest though and, with each filled by a far too familiar crimson substance, were instantly suspect. However, they were unlabeled so their true contents could be innocuous. If one hoped hard enough. No. It was the glass jars that grabbed and held the attention of the heroes in training and their Jaeger instructors with an iron grip. Fetuses. In various stages of development, some so small they looked no different than a mass of cells, each glass jar contained its own nightmarish load. Some also held large, egg-like fleshy bags, but based on their neighbors' contents the true nature of those bags could be guessed easily enough. Lastly and almost completely overlooked, was a machine that appeared to be a cross between a centrifuge and some sort of, mixer. Animals. Bloodborne growled, his mind quickly affixing all of the pieces together. He felt nauseous just at the mere implications. Trigger, such as it was known, had always been described as a drug that altered the quirk factor of the user by artificially stimulating their plus alpha genes, leading to increased quirk potency or temporary awakenings. 
It had also always been known to be, incredibly addictive and come with a high risk of causing mental instability. As time went on, strains of the drug had been concocted that were even mutagenic in nature, if no less addictive and destabilizing. However, this widely held understanding of the drug was half-fast at best. Exactly how did trigger affect the user's quirk factor, a fundamental part of their being? Chemical compounds, alone could disrupt and or alter DNA, sure, but such effects would be minor in the short term and far from dramatic as trigger use was known to be. It would take significant use over time, or doses high enough to induce instant death, to get something like a finger blade quirk to the point it appeared more like a sword hand quirk. Stem cells, however, could solve such a mystery. Capable of doing, any task by becoming anything, stem cells, especially those from a mutant type individual that were even more transmutative by nature, would theoretically be able to override a person's original genetic code by matching it, but with trigger signature boost coded in. And if those stem cells came from a mutant type who by all appearances could stand in for Echidna, mother of monsters, PPPEEs, Bloodborne flinched, ripped from his thoughts as the woman chained to the bed tried to speak. Her voice, whispery and weak, sounded as if it were fighting through immense pain and grief just to be heard. Pee pee please. The woman said again, key kill me. Bloodborne felt his rage spike at the plea. He made to take a step into the room, but Gardiner moved first, throwing a hand against his chest and keeping him back. Almost snarling. The necromancer whipped his head around to the hypocritical bastard who would dare hold him back from saving someone in need. Only to freeze as he saw the grit teeth and tear tracks trailing down the violet's masked face. Swallowing, Bloodborne focused on his classmate, only then realizing the teen was stiffly, and frantically, eyeballing the rest, of the room. He'd been scanning for traps. Damn it. Realizing he could have just gotten them all killed by letting his emotions drive his actions and activating some sort of security measure, Bloodborne swallowed his fury and revulsion down and kept still. Needing to be able to move, to help, he quickly decided to add his own eyes to the search. The room was small, smaller than either room in the basement they'd already been in, the walls were bare as well even the ceiling failing to show signs of hidden defenses such as paneling or misplaced dust. Unfortunately, his careful scanning became a double-edged sword, and Bloodborne realized something else horrific about the room. There were no signs of the laboratory equipment being moved away from the woman, not even a single scuff mark on the floor. These monsters, more, deserving of the name than as Yuku had ever been, had conducted their work right in front of their victim which meant she'd not only been forced to carry nascent life against her will, but then had been forced to see and feel that life be ripped out of her and processed. Like it was nothing more than an ingredient in a recipe. Bloodborne's grip on his threaded cane tightened until the knuckles beneath his gloves turned white as bone. Room's clear. Hang in there ma'am, we're getting you out of there. Gardener declared instantly lowering the arm against Bloodborne and all but rushing to the captive woman. Everything will be, kill. Me. The woman said again, her broken voice matching the emptiness in her tone. It was the voice of someone who didn't want to continue anymore, please. Gardener was experiencing his worst nightmare. He'd arrived late to a rescue before, and had even failed completely once, but never in all his time at the garden had he ever faced an individual who just given up. He'd heard his aunties speak about it before, late at night when he should have been in bed and asleep, and their descriptions of victims being so destroyed they'd lost the will to live. To even be rescued and work towards healing had been unbelievable. Staring the truth in the face. It made his blood boil. And yet, the room was entirely silence, bar the weak pleading of the drug maker's victim. Boboss? Wraith finally called out weakly. Her link to her master was flooding her with a rage unlike anything she'd ever felt before. It was all-consuming, all-encompassing, and yet, surprisingly cold. The victim has made their intention clear, the crow cut in, interrupting the scene. She stepped forward into the room with a death-like stillness, brandishing a heavy and wicked-looking dagger. She has no desire to continue suffering in this world. 
both heroes in training and the two undead present turned to look at the Jaeger in shock and horror. Well, Ghoul just turned and, glared. Seeing a victim of a heinous crime die in front of them hadn't been on the mission's dossier, much less for their murder to be carried out at the hands of their own instructor. When what? Bloodborne stammered out, his own sensibilities abruptly crashing and burning at the unexpected path this entire operation had taken. Gardiner would have seconded his notion if he hadn't been too busy, choking on his own emotions. Death is a part of life, and as hunters, it is our duty to administer it swiftly and efficiently whenever needed, the crow said, holding her dagger with both hands before, with a swift motion, splitting it into thinner blades. That applies both as just punishment for the deserving wicked, or as sweet release for the pleading afflicted. In a moment that further, shattered the two teens' expectations, they suddenly found themselves holding one of the crow's daggers each. The divided blades were wicked, jagged things on their outer sides, and even a bit rusted near their hilts. Their combined form was an unpractical weapon, one whose design was crafted to dispense a most painful death upon the prey. When split, however, the internal edges of the new blades, were revealed, clean, sharp and smooth. From that side, the blades could have passed as surgical tools designed to cut deep and fast, preventing any undue pain while being employed. It seems that mercy will be another lesson that you two will learn today, the crow continued, solemn yet uncompromising. The Jaegers are not heroes, our hands are not clean. We do not save people, we save the world. And, we do that through the hunt. We seek out our prey and let nothing, not even civilians, get in our way. But that does not mean we are without mercy. When we find injured souls, those who have suffered to the point they can no longer seek out life, we recognize that it is our duty to offer those unfortunates one last mercy. Eternal rest. The dogma held no emotion, only logic. A gloved hand on each, teen's shoulder pointing them towards the chained woman, still appearing to have gone through a living nightmare. Worse still, the poor woman, seeming to realize that release was finally at hand, shakily raised her head and nodded weakly looking grateful. Bloodborne and Gardener stared at the knives in their hands, at the daggers they held to end a life. How were they supposed to react to this, this couldn't be the right answer? There had to be a way out of this. Right? Nearly forgotten to the side, Wraith jerked out of the blue screen she'd been stuck in and grit her teeth. Taking a deep breath, even though she knew she didn't technically need to, she stepped forward. She knew what needed to be done here what she needed to do. As one of her boss's enforcers, it only made sense. She, would deliver the old beach's mercy the boss wasn't ready for something like this, it was clear to see and even resonated as low, panicky pinpricks across the bond she had with him. She, however, was already dead, and hadn't been a stranger to death before her end anyway. She'd save her boss from the trauma, and the stigma, of taking his first life before he'd even made it as a pro. Before she, could take another step, Ghoul reached out and gripped the blonde's shoulder, holding her in place rather fiercely. Before she could turn to shout at her sister for interfering, Wraith noticed the grave look the Ravnet held in her dull eyes. Wait. What was? What was that? W.A. chat. Is. Thy. Desire? Bloodborne clenched his teeth hard. He hated this. Why did it always seem like the world was hell, bent on making things exceedingly shitty? Why was he being put in this situation? Couldn't he just save the woman now and get her to a psychiatrist? Why was the crow adamant that he and Gardner had to kill her? Taking a life was the easy way. It was infuriating, really. Me Midria. Gardner choked out actually breaking protocol and speaking the Verdanet civilian name. Without turning his, head, Bloodborne looked over to his classmate. The Violet did not look like he was dealing with their new task well. If his heart were any more on his sleeve it would have been coated in blood. Can can't you do something? Your quirk heals everything right? Can it heal souls? A brief flare of misdirected anger sparked in Bloodborne at hearing yet another person see his damned quirk as a, be all and all. And what about you? He growled, 
Just tell her to not be suicidal. Hell, demand she go to a hospital and get help. That would solve everything wouldn't it? The flash of anger was immediately snuffed out entirely when Bloodborne heard Gardener's breath catch in his throat before he tried to swallow it down. A stifled sob followed, and the Verdinet felt like a complete bastard for, taking his frustration out on his helpless classmate. The sheer despair in the insomniac's voice, even through his voice modulator, should have clued him. Gardener couldn't do much of anything in this situation, at least with his quirk. Brainwashing required speech in response to Active 8. It then hijacked the brain's frontal lobe and took over the motor function of anyone under its influence. However, as he'd seen in the sports festival and had been reminded of several times since the internship, was that Gardener's quirk was nowhere near perfect? A simple jostling could break someone from its hold. Any commands over the basics were nearly impossible for those under it to complete as the cerebellum wasn't affected by its control and thus fine-tuning of motor functions was out of the question. Those under the quirk also couldn't speak for the same reason due to the temporal lobe. And worst of all, for a situation like this, those under brainwashing spell would come to without any change in their original behavior. Gardener couldn't hypnotize people and give them directives to be or think differently when they woke up. That wasn't how his quirk worked. So using Brainwashing on the woman chained to the bed in front of them would ultimately do nothing, except probably make a gardener feel horrible for using his quirk on a woman who'd already lost so much control over her own life. Almost cracking his teeth from gnashing them at how stupid and thoughtless he'd been, Bloodborne reached out and laid an understanding hand on his classmate's arm. Sorry. I, just, sorry. Seeing neither of the students appeared to be willing or able to take the necessary step, Crow shook her head. The first gift of mercy was always the hardest. How long had it been since she'd been in their place? Had she ever? She made to take the daggers back to do the deed herself, but right before she could, Bloodborne stepped forward. Yes, the Verdana said, grimly approaching, the chained woman. Besides his feet taking him closer to her. The teen was still a stone as he moved. Then, he raised the dagger in his hand. To his other wrist, which had somehow gotten ungovered. I will save her. Even from despair. Even from herself. Had the crow not been a consummate hunter, one with years under her belt, she would have flinched back at the ore she suddenly felt boiling up from, the teen in front of her. She made to stop him out of instinct. Every one of her senses was screaming at her that whatever was about to happen would be completely out of her capabilities to undo. She felt in her bones that, the one called Wraith blocked her way. Didn't you tell him to deliver mercy? The undead delinquent asked, a grin full of false bravado snarling back at the Jaeger. Let the boss, do his work, will ya? More concerned that her intern zombie was acting on its own than trying to stop her since any attempt to actually do so would have met with the undead's immediate, and final, demise, the crone nonetheless paused. She narrowed her eyes behind her mask. It seemed she'd be getting front row seats to the mission's secondary objective after all. Do not, poor soul, seek death's embrace, bloodborne intoned, as he reached the woman. While you've so much of life to face. The woman, still chained, began to shiver as the strangely dressed man with the knife no longer appeared to be deciding on whether to kill her or not, but something else entirely. She would have struggled, but after being held captive so long, and the horrors she'd endured in this room, her broken body could hardly muster the energy to, lean her head back so she could keep an eye on the new possible tormentor. For though your wounds are grave and deep, the necromancer continued, eyes bleeding from green to red. Hope still remains as yours to keep. Bloodborne raised his wrist, sliding the crow's half-dagger against his skin just right to make a bleeding cut without nicking an artery. The woman chained to the bed didn't even have, time, or the energy, to yelp before he pressed the bleeding appendage against her lips. The first gulp was entirely out of reflex, more to wet a dry mouth than to accept the dubious gift. But, it was enough. This is my mercy. Freely given, Bloodborne spoke, feeling as cursed blood activated. Your grief. Your pain and sorrow riven. 
Between one long moment and the next, the woman's eyes snapped, open. Slitted citrines pulsed before transitioning to glowing rubies. The crow tensed, seeing what she'd been briefed about in person. They'd been told their charges both had quirks that had the potential to upend the world, but nothing had prepared her for actually experiencing the more dangerous one in action. I demand, here and now, that Nemosine release your brow, Bloodborne still went on. As, far as commands to cursed blood went, this had to be one of his longest. But it had to be. He couldn't risk messing this one up. And free you from your burdens hands your just and rightful recompense. The crow had expected a great many things from seeing a supposedly extremely dark quirk in action, the list of sinister applications had almost been longer than the profile on the teen himself, right then, she'd thought this had all been some elaborate way of giving the victim a peaceful death through some theater. Not how she'd thought he'd use his quirk, but thankfully not the worse. But then. Then the woman began to visibly gain a healthier coloration, her blue skin and scales no longer dull and lackluster. The open wounds that had run up and down her body, the scars that had marked, their predecessors. They all began to fade. One death there'll be, and that is true, Bloodborne finally declared, taking his wrist away from the woman. By that point she was able to sit up straight, her long tentacle-like hair the only cover to her modesty. To memories that torment you. Now sleep, now slumber. The dark is past, when you awake, your new life will last. Bloodborne pulled his wrist, back, the cut already healing shut. In contrast to the words spoken, the rescued woman didn't actually fall asleep right then. Or at least, she didn't appear to be asleep. Once Bloodborne had stepped back, the woman straightened in her bed, pulling the chains that held her to the point they snapped. Her limbs, while still appearing to be emaciated, now held more than enough strength to break the restraints her physical abilities now augmented to the point she could blitz her way out of the room if needed and yet it was obvious that the woman wasn't about to move any further her breaking free of the chains hadn't been intentional action merely a consequence of sitting up from under a fringe of shorter tentacle hair red glowing eyes marked the woman as a thrall of cursed blood she was a prisoner of the sinister hero's will, yet that meant she was still alive and in the process of recovering from her ordeal. When taking that into consideration and measuring it against the action he'd taken to get there the crow didn't feel as if the teen had committed any crime. True, his ability was terrifying to witness, even for one such as her, but saving a life was saving a life, and, could hardly be thought of as villainous. Smith had warned them about how powerful his quirk was, but even as seriously as the agent had delivered her debrief then, now seemed criminally understated in light of what she'd just witnessed, and was witnessing, now. Will she be able to walk on her own? The crow finally asked, earning a wince from Gardner, who, absorbed as he had been in Bloodborne's actions, had forgotten that they were still on a mission. We cannot delay further, no matter what. Bloodborne muttered a curse under his breath. Of course he'd be rushed after just using control and having cursed blood set in. He would have liked to have been able to personally take this abused woman to a safe place but. Well, Jaegers weren't rescue heroes. Yes, she can move on her own. But, on, it. Gardener interrupted, pulling down his voice modulator. Hastily, he pulled out his standard issue tactical phone the one all heroes and heroes in training used in the field. Calling for a pickup now. They might be able to get here before we even leave. There had rarely been a time that Hitoshi Shinso was more grateful for his family, and their protocols regarding rescuing those in need, than, just then. He just needed to use the proper code words with whoever answered the phone and Mama Yu and Naoji would do the rest. No questions asked. Until later. The call took less than a minute, a quick exchange of words far too fast for Bloodborne to follow. He barely had time to give the woman orders to await further rescue somewhere safe before Gardner had hung up and they were returning to, the room where the other Jaggers and captives still were. Sting operations such as theirs had a time limit, 
and once time ran out even Jaggers had to clear the scene before the risks became too great for the powers that be grew too unhappy. Since they'd completed the interrogation, and even managed to find and confiscate the means of this branch of the Trigger Ring's production, that meant they, were running out of time. They'd have to leave soon, and knowing that, both heroes in training wondered how the Jaggers were going to handle the monsters they'd discovered there. The so-called scientists didn't deserve much mercy, but they were prisoners and had surrendered. By law they had to be handed over to the authorities for due processing and sentencing. The question was, how were they, going to both keep them in place for police pickup while also leaving post haste to their next destination? Opening the door back to the room gave them their answer. HNN. The bear heaved as he brought his axe downward in a giant cleaving swing. Thwonk. A rather wet and fleshy sound followed the motion. The head scientist was leaning over the table, his neck bent horribly after suffering the impact of what anyone could tell was a blunted edge. Gurgle. The blunted axe still cut his flesh open, even if it only did so after crushing the man's trachea and maybe a vertebra or two. H.N. The bear heaved again, striking the white coat for a second time. Splurge. This time the man's head was ripped off, unable to remain connected under the strength and pressure of the Jaeger's blows. Immediately a grotesque spluttering geezer of blood and gore spewed from the mauled stump that had been the scientist's neck. The two teens felt their hearts freeze in their chests as they witnessed a murder right before their eyes. A scream died in Izuku's throat. Hitoshi's stomach tried to rebel. The two silently looked at each other in wide-eyed disbelief. There are beasts all over the shop, the bear spoke for the first time, his words clearly directed at the teens even if he still hadn't turned to face them. You'll deal with them, sooner or later. The sight was so poignant that both heroes in training nearly missed when the fox stepped through the remaining captives, his serrated blade drawn and carving through their throats as if they were wheat in the field. That day, as those men, and women died around them, is Yuku and Hitoshi, Students of the prestigious UA Academy, learned that against the darkness of their world, those in power saw unleashing dark monsters of their own as their most efficient method of combat. Jaggers were neither rescue heroes, nor capture heroes. They weren't combat heroes or stealth heroes, or even underground heroes. They weren't heroes at all, Jaggers were monsters, dogs of war unleashed to put an end to horrible things by any means necessary. Neither teen would later argue that the inhuman scientists didn't deserve their fates, but even so, their hearts would still yearn for a more legitimate approach. Magnus, for those of you who are unaware, there is a poll active to decide which story will follow after the completion of Blessed, with a hero's heart. The poll will remain open until the second to last chapter of that story is published. Omake, karma inside of a much too small office. A certain elderly lady kept to her task of organizing paperwork as she mentally went over the history of the company she'd been working for. Thurigir was the name of the business, short, easy to understand, and a name made of two words with, wait enough to catch the eye all by themselves. Those were important aspects for a company focused on making the costumes and support gear for pro heroes. Unfortunately, its name was the only great thing about the company. What was she thinking? The woman thought as she placed the latest batch of files in a corresponding cabinet, there was no need nor reason to do such a thing, situated in a smaller sized warehouse, the entirety of the Harry Gear company, from its offices to its workshops to even its storage area, was all in one place. In fact, calling it a small business was almost too generous for the company. Which was unfortunate. When it had been founded, the gear had been filled with those who dreamed of producing only the best gear for a promising hero students, and, one day, proper pro heroes. Years later, the fledgling support gear company could only eke out mediocre gear at best, and was only contracted by those who felt like showing a little pity for a might have been business. This is just so unfair. The elderly woman continued thinking as she grabbed up the next batch of papers to process. Seeing the lengthy print, she steeled herself for a thorough, read. It was by far the best contract we'd ever had. She should have spared no expense to make sure it worked out. 
The sad truth was that Herigir had fallen prey to the same hard reality that most up-and-coming support companies did. Big-name clients almost always stayed with big-name companies. Small-time companies like hers, in contrast, had to fight tooth and nail for contracts with even the bigger rural hero schools, the fifth or sixth options on hero hopefuls lists. Anything bigger would be nothing but a pipe dream. Their CEO, however, had refused to give up. She'd continued to send brochures to all the better-known hero schools like Ueshikitsu, Ketsubustu, and even CI and Asamu, year after year. The pamphlets had promised their potential clients that they'd use the best, materials available, and that they'd keep the prices cheaper. All lies and embellishments. By best materials available, the CEO had meant best we can afford. And keeping the prices cheaper, had only been relative to their bigger, larger rivals, she'd still overpriced their gear by a wide margin. Imagine their surprise then when one day their dear CEO had burst into the office with a new, contract in hand, one from not only a big-name hero school, but the biggest and best. In retrospect, the moment she'd seen the official seal of UA on that paperwork, she should have quit. Anyone with half a brain knew that UA didn't just expect their contracted support gear companies to perform their best, they expected them to apply the school's own motto of plus ultra to everything they did, for her gear. As pitiful as they were, such an opportunity wasn't a chance to catch their big break but an outright assurance of corporate suicide. We'll just make a cute little suit for the mutie, she said, the old woman groused, remembering the CEO's words as she stamped the document in front of her before reaching for another notice of resignation. It's not like we'll have to give more than a token effort for a regenerator who's not even going to last past the sports festival, she said. After obviously accepting the contract, the students' notes and specifications had then arrived at the office. The schematics included had been nothing short of a marvel. Not only had the suit been designed to a T, almost as if the student knew what they were doing, but assimilating the various techniques proposed would have been invaluable to Hurigir's future as a support company. The ideas had been endless, imaginative ways to weave ballistic fibers sewing techniques that increased a fabric's durability tenfold, proposals for alternative materials that reduced costs but minimized loss of quality. It had been brilliant. It had been exactly what Harry Gear had needed. And it had all been, dismissed by the CEO because it had all come from, just a lowly mutant. Said lowly mutant, one as Yuku Midoriya, had not been what he seemed at a simple glance, however. His prowess had proven to be monstrous, his powers sinister. But more important than either of those, his deeds had been truly heroic. It seemed like overnight the eyes of the entire country had turned to him, and not a few people, had loudly begun asking for the details of his gear. And that had been what kicked off their little company's journey to hell. She should have known, the woman lamented, authorizing the final resignation notice leaving her as the last soul remaining at Herigir besides the CEO. A mutant he might have been, but Midoriya was still a UA student. By the glowing baby's light, there was no way he wasn't destined for some sort of greatness. It should have been a logical conclusion that he would have needed gear of the highest quality. When the company had shipped out their pitiful suit, which hadn't integrated even half of the specifications requested, the CEO had openly proclaimed two things would happen. First, she'd assured everyone that the mutant freak would drop out before he could be seen wearing their gear for too long. Secondly, she'd declared that as soon as that inevitability occurred, they would be able to glorify her gear to all and sundry as a support company that had made gear for a student of UA. No one needed to know whether or not said student was adequately served by their product or if they were still enrolled at the prestigious academy. Instead, what had happened was their gear predictably failed miserably upon its first deployment, and as Yuku Midoriya had been forced to completely replace it with the work of a student from UA support course. When video clips and photos of the reworked suit made their way to the public, it lacked any and all insignias of hero gear. Their very name had been brushed aside in the redesign, swept beneath the proverbial carpet like so much dirt. Of course, 
All credit for the suit was then placed upon the shoulders of that support course student, a young girl named Maihatsume. Worse, the chit had then soon become a roar amongst heroes and support companies alike. She hadn't just hit it big. Hadn't just struck gold. The damn drunt was now known throughout the entire country as one of only a select, few high school students who held contracts with the JSDF and the Ministry of Justice. The old woman sighed as she stamped and filed the last of her paperwork. Desk now clear, she pulled out her own notice of resignation. The situation might have been unfair, but in no way, shape, or form was so through the fault of one as Yuku Midoriya. In fact, the first and only document they'd received from UA, after they'd sent out the subpar gear had been a notice of dismissal. The paperwork had described every fault that could be found in their work as well as clarified that until Hiragir paid reparations for its obviously false advertising, UA would make sure that the company would receive no other contracts. Period. It had been a low blow to their morale, not to mention their credibility, but it had stopped there. A simple apology and a return of funds and they could have at least started over at square one. But no. The CEO just couldn't accept such a slap to the face with grace and honor. Far from it, Nabiki Tendo, founder and CEO of Hiragir, had gathered the all-female staff of the company and announced that Midoriya's fame and glory deserved to be hers, theirs, surely she'd meant, theirs, and that his use of someone else's gear, even if theirs had completely failed him, was a clear violation of contract. Immediately after the rousing declaration, Tendo had found the cheapest lawyer she could and demanded a lawsuit be filed against the mutant boy. The boy. Not Yue and not my Hatsume. Tendo had fixated on Midori like a woman possessed. She'd might have always been greedy. But that had never dulled her senses. Attacking a hero academy or a girl under the wing of the JSDF slash Ministry of Justice would have been suicide. But then, attacking a boy who'd never held a contract with them as the terms had been set with UA and not an individual student, had turned out to be just as stupid. Even if the case had made it to some court, they would have been laughed out of the courtroom before they could finish stating the facts of the case. The lawsuit never reached his Yuku Midoriya though. Tendo had failed to understand that the actual recipient of the summons of complaint would have been UA lawyers, as again, their contract was actually with the school, not its student. And this was the reason for the tsunami of resignations as well. Had countersued them. In a, cruelly kind brief, the academy's lawyers had plainly stated each and every piece of hard evidence they had that would absolutely destroy her gear in court. Everyone had instantly seen that the flagging ship was speeding straight for an iceberg too large to avoid. Goodbye. Sis. With that final thought, Kasumi Tendo signed and stamped her own resignation. It might have been a dick move, she, acknowledged, but she didn't want to sink any lower than she already had for the pettiness of her sister. While she knew her, and everyone else's, severance pay might default in the end, it was at least a relief to know that they wouldn't have to be involved in the legal nightmare that was about to kick off. Kasumi. Get me in touch with all the lawyers you know. That bastard just quit on us. The, roar came from the CEO's office a high-pitched scream that betrayed the growing panic of someone who was slowly realizing that they were utterly and completely screwed. Kasumi. Kasumi. Omake, good intentions. In the comfort of his bedroom, away from the stresses and responsibilities of his everyday life, a certain middle-aged man watched a selection of videos taken from the most recent uh, sports festival. There were a lot of things to take note of this year particularly regarding the young boy who'd been labeled the monster of UA monster. The bespectacled man with a honey-colored mane muttered to himself as he scratched at his bearded chin, of all the epithets, they chose monster. The man might not have been Japanese, but he held a lot of interest in the island country, especially in, its number one hero, his oldest, dearest friend. It tugged at David Shields hard to know that Tashi's might was diminishing and that his retirement was imminent. That being said, he did feel that his friend had done more than enough to merit a proper rest. On the other hand, the idea of the world losing such a beacon of peace filled him with dread. 
such an eventuality would be a devastating blow to society. Even if his successor arose to take All Might's place, David didn't know who the young man or woman was, but he doubted the kid would be able to fill the shoes of the symbol of peace quickly enough to avoid at least one catastrophe. The transition was definitely going to be a painful one. It's times like this that I have to wonder why Japan insists on keeping that outdated Gork hierarchy of theirs alive, David lamented, clicking, through different clips as his eyes sparkled with far too much intensity. Can't they see the limitless potential of this kid? Even if they were dead set on him not becoming a limelight hero, they could at least give him credit where credit is due, right? Enough to convince him to join an agency in a combat support role at least. Being honest with himself, the more time passed, the more David, realized he didn't want Hashi's reign as All Might to end just yet. Finding and training a successor wasn't a bad thing, it was no believe in, but the world would still need a symbol until the kid was ready and the transition could be completed. Therefore, All Might needed to stay the number one for as long as possible. In order to achieve this, David's brilliant mind had come up with some ideas. Some had been less sane than others, admittedly, but many of those had still been deemed viable enough in the end. One such plan, which straddled the line between acceptable and mad, had been centered on aiding the world's greatest hero with an outside quirk to augment his ailing body. A quirk like the one wielded by the so-called monster of UA as Yuku Midoriya was an interesting boy. There was, no doubt about that. His participation during the first two events of the sports festival had been clear indicators of a bright mind and a resolute heart. The tournament though, that had been the eye-opener to a world of possibilities. While the boy was clearly not invulnerable, his ability to survive ungodly amounts of otherwise lethal damage was almost totally unheard of. There'd been rumors of, a quirk or two that amounted to hyper-regeneration, but those had all disappeared a number of years ago. Doubtlessly they'd just been gossip. But Midoriya. He'd been the real deal. Unfortunately, the ignorance of mob mentality had latched on to the kids' abilities and labeled them as something unholy. But. What if All Might were to be gifted with such amazing regenerative power? Would that be, enough to rekindle his flagging quirk factor? Enhance it even? The mere idea of seeing his friend, the greatest hero to ever live return to full power was, Papa. Before David could even attempt to respond to the sudden call breaking him from his thoughts, a young woman with large glasses and long, cascading hair matching his own entered the room. Are you watching that festival footage again? She, asked, how many times has it been now? The girl placed a tray with food on it on a table to the side and promptly turned the bevy of monitors off with a flick of her wrist. David held back his disappointment at losing sight of his current muse and instead raised his hands up as if in surrender. Sorry, Melissa. David apologized as he got up to sit at the table, it's just. You know. If we could, analyze that Midoriya boy and his quirk. Forget it Papa. You know the guys downstairs confirm that Interpol got its claws in him already, Melissa cut in quickly, earning a sigh from her father. Besides. According to his file he's a mutant type. There's an astronomically small chance that he has some central organ that controls his entire quirk. And that means that there's probably no way to, perform a surgical quirk transference, or even use it to advance your quirk rejuvenation idea. David looked up at his daughter with a pained stare. He really hated it when he had to hear that his brilliant ideas were really just impossibilities. He especially hated to hear it when some breakthroughs had been made. Early test samples of the original drug the reunited states had designed to boost, its solder's quirks, the true progenitor of Traeger, had shown promise in the rejuvenation program. If he could just get a few samples of the newer strains, then maybe a stabilized prototype could be synthesized in time to show on the next Thai Expo. And if it went over well there. Take it easy Papa. Melissa continued, ruffling her father's hair. There were chuckles at that, a string of ideas and findings shared, and then the head scientist and inventor of I Island was left alone again. As the door closed behind Melissa, a sad smile came across his face. David loved his daughter. He loved her enough to give her the world.
That was why it pained him so much to see that his otherwise brilliant little girl was unable to understand the importance of bringing All Might back to full strength. Maybe I can send the boy some tickets to come to the expo. David muttered to himself as he returned to the videos. I'm sure he'd be glad to cooperate if he knew why this research was so important. I'm sure of it. Saving All Might was greater than just having good intentions, he was sure of that too. The world would forgive him if he was forced to make a few tough decisions.